to order. So councilors this evening, we have one item on the public hearing agenda scheduled to begin at 6.30, where we're a little behind. The purpose of this hearing is for council to hear input from the public prior to making a decision on the proposal. To the members of the public who have chosen to come this evening, welcome. Everyone that wishes will have an opportunity to be heard. Tonight, council may approve, reject, or defer its decision on the proposal to a later date. Council approval is required for the proposal to proceed. I will now ask our municipal clerk, Lori, to outline when the public hearing advertisements were published. Uh, Warden, a public hearing notice appeared in the June 6th and June 13th editions of the Chronicle Herald. The notice described the proposal, gave the date, time, and location of this public hearing, and indicated that the proposed documents were available to the public if requested. Okay, thank you. Councillors, on the public hearing scheduled this evening is a proposal to consider updates and amendments to the land use bylaw and municipal planning strategy. I would like now to ask Jared, Jared Diel, project planner for, from WSB to present his report. And, and with Jared tonight, we have also from the firm Ann Winters. So Jared, you're on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, we're here to discuss the new municipal plan and land use bylaw we've prepared. Um, I'm a land use planner that works with WSP and Ann Winters. If you want to give a quick hand raise, Ann, um, did a lot of the work also here with me. So really at the intent of the presentation tonight is to present the new municipal plan and land use bylaw that reflects and addresses an updated community context, as well as updated opportunities and challenges for the municipality of Argyle. We're here to review the updates for public members and for them to provide comment to council on the documents as presented. And really following the public hearing is the time for the formal decision, the real yes, no, um, for the documents to move forward or go back for review or to proceed. If approved this evening at um, the council meeting following this public hearing, uh, provincial approval would begin. Um, what that means is really the province reviews the documents to assure that the statements of provincial interest are met and the minimum planning standards are met. So in terms of how we got here, we've done a number of engagement outreach activities in the fall and in the winter before COVID began. Uh, we did some research papers and topic papers that council and planning advisory committee would have seen previously. And that allowed us to start working on the initial draft. Uh, once we had that prepared, we had a, a number of iterations of staff review. And then we presented those drafts to council and planning advisory committee. Uh, and that's really following that is when we began the formal participation process, which was definitely led by the staff at Miss Valley of Argyle uh, to lead us towards the council decision and the public hearing here this evening. Uh, and if approved, as I mentioned, it would proceed uh, to the province for final adoption or approval. Uh, in terms of some engagement kind of leading up to this point, uh, we've engaged with 15 municipal staff, six stakeholder groups, about 100 people in the community in person. We did pop up en engagement activities and about 114 people through our online survey. And just for the public members here this evening, I want to give a brief overview of uh, a bit of how these documents interact and really what, the, what, what these documents mean, what their intent is. Uh, the province through the Municipal Government Act allows municipalities to do planning activities. And there's two main documents they use to do that. So one's the municipal plan, which really lays out the policy intent for how council wants to see the municipality develop moving forward. Um, this is the, the document that get, gets reviewed and looked at if someone wants to come in for an application that would require rezoning or a dis development agreement, which is essentially a contract zone made between a council and a developer or a landowner. And really it lets, it gives council the guidance on what, how their decision making and their decision process should be done. Uh, and these are living documents too as well. So I mean, they get changed over time. Uh, they get constantly updated and tweaked as um, situations change really in municipalities. That's really the idea for these documents. Uh, the other major one is what's called the land use bylaw. 
um, that document lays out a number of what are called zones. So that's really, I like to call it the cookbook for how you're going to uh, do most developments in municipalities. So it lays out the setbacks, the general zone provisions and requirements, um, as well as kind of the, the general intent for what would take place in those zones in terms of development. And those can, as I mentioned, um, go back for review or edits or tweaking um, upon review of the missile planning strategy and what, what an individual applicant or somebody looking to build something is looking to do. Um, in terms of the new planning framework uh, in these documents, um, we've created a really, it's a rename of the general use zones, which are called the coastal community zones. Um, how these documents are laid out, there's something called what's a GFLUM, or Generalized Future Land Use Map. And those, that's a map in the municipal planning strategy that lays out kind of the general intent for development in certain areas. And I'll show you kind of what that looks like in a moment. Uh, and then it, within those, that generalized future land use map is broken into those individual zones. Uh, in this case, for the coastal community designation, for instance, you have the coastal community zone, the coastal community industrial zone, and the marine industrial zone. Um, a lot of those were existing really. There was a general use zone and the general use industrial zone in the current documents the municipality has. However, they are in the coastal communities areas and we wanted to kind of rename them to make it a bit more specific and a bit more tailored to where those are actually applied in the municipality. There's also some new zones that have taken place, uh, one of which is the wellhead protection zone. Uh, and then the intent with that is really to protect the uh, East Pubnico water utility um, pipe for intake on Willett Road. Uh, so that would prevent, let's say, like gas stations and things that have a high potential for leachate if there was to be uh, an environmental catastrophe or some sort of issue that comes up. Uh, there's also the floodplain zone, which we applied to Quinnan. Um, and that's going off of the aerial imagery we have where, of where floods occur in those areas at the moment. And the intent for that is if you think about floodplains, um, if you think about a glass of water, uh, and then you are going to add rocks to it. And each of those rocks kind of lay, raises up the water level in that glass. Um, and really, if you think about it, an area of land, um, if the, the rocks in that analogy were buildings, that's what development in a floodplain can do. So over time, it, if development is allowed to take place in a floodplain area, it raises the average flood level in that area, and that can endanger more and more people's homes and create more and more issues when it comes to development and risks for folks. So that's really the intent behind that. It is something the province requires us to do uh, through their minimum planning standards and the missile statements of interest. Um, there's also been some updates to what are called the coastal wetland zones. So the province does uh, ident identification of coastal wetland areas. Uh, and we had that in the current set of documents. However, um, they're constantly kind of redoing the imagery for them and getting more precise on where these are located. So there's an update to where those locations would take place in this new set of documents, just to reflect kind of the, the better knowledge we have about that wetland delineation. And if you, I mentioned the GFLUM or Generalized Future Land Use Map, as well as the zoning maps in the prior slide. Um, sometimes they can look quite, quite uh, similar. So the GFLUM map is to the left here, the zoning map is to the right. And really the thing to point out is that there's a number of those sub zones zones, I should say, within those generalized future land use areas, which kind of lays out areas in more detail. So for instance, a lot, there's a lot of industrial zones in Argyle um, that are really applied to existing industrial areas or some of the initial requests we've had as part of this review. And really what led us to do a lot of this project um, was, was some issues regarding clarity and consistency in the current uh, planning documents and zoning. Uh, really the documents are 20 years old. Uh, there's been some kind of changes over time as these things always have happened. Um, and there's been some inconsistencies on in how those changes will take place. And this is quite common throughout planning documents in the province, just generally. Uh, the intent with kind of doing this update is really to make the process simpler, um, to, to get rid of or clean up any of those uh, inconsistencies where things might not actually align and say in the zoning bylaw about how they want to see development proceed forward and really make it more predictable for people about what would be permitted where, as well as provide some more um, resiliency about the future regarding unknown events with those floodplain zones and other, other things that are supposed to be added in. And really the intent overall is to give municipality the tools and flexibility it needs to respond to a changing economy, housing market, population, natural environment. There's some just bigger changes I wanted to update people on. 
Um, there's some updates to the brewery and distillery um, zoning that we did just kind of before this review. That has been tweaked a little bit uh, leading into this set of documents. Uh, there's been some changes to the definition of restaurants. Um, previously in the current zoning, um, patios would not be able to take place. They couldn't serve food, let's say, on a restaurant patio. Uh, and that's proposed to be added as something you could do uh, through that definition of a restaurant use uh, up until 9 p.m. And after that, they'd have to come in for what's called the development agreement or that contract zone, where we'd take a look at where it is and what impact it might have on adjacent residences. Uh, there's also been changes to cannabis production. So as I mentioned, the documents you have now are 20 years old. Um, and it wasn't really called out as a, what's called a separate land use. Um, so really what happens is someone comes in for, let's say a development permit. Uh, you look at the current set of uses you have in those zoning documents. Um, in this case at the moment, right now, the agricultural use would actually encompass all the cannabis type of activities you'd see with production and processing. Um, so there's been one application, I believe, that's been approved with a cannabis production facility now under the current set of documents. Um, and that agricultural use would be permitted in the mixed use zone, the general use zone, the rural development zone. Uh, in the new documents and really what most areas are doing in terms of planning, uh, they're breaking out cannabis as a separate land use. It does tend to be a bit more um, industrial, especially on kind of the larger or standard processing operations. Um, so there's kind of a, a bend on how this will, is proposed to be regulated. So one would be a micro production or micro processing facility. And those are locations under 200 square meters of plant area and a standard license for production facilities that have greater than that uh, threshold. Uh, as it's currently written in the proposed documents, mi micro licenses are proposed to be permitted in the heavy industrial zone, the coastal community industrial zone, the rural development zone, what's called as of right, so someone could come in today and apply for a development permit if they're in one of those zones, as well as it could be considered by a development agreement in the mixed use zone or coastal community zone where, where conditions could be attached to it and the placement relative uh, to, let's say, other people's homes or where it is on the road could be considered. Um, standard licenses always would require a development agreement, um, which they tend to be much larger facilities and have associated larger impacts with things like odor um, or traffic, and they have like requirements regarding fencing. Uh, that would be proposed to be considered the heavy industrial zone, the coastal community industrial zone, and the rural development zone. I'm going to run through just some of the overall arching goals of the missile plan, and then um, I'll go into some of the other kind of smaller tweaks we propose to make. Uh, really the thing to keep in mind is th this is supposed to kind of lay out some of the, the broad strategy for council. Um, council will recall us kind of having a visit visioning session with them and the idea would be that some of those pieces would likely get tied into strategic planning exercises later. So it's not always about kind of regulating development. It does try to provide some uh, context and thought about kind of broader issues that could be addressed. In terms of the goals that are currently written in the plan, uh, one would be to increase the diversity and resiliency of the local economy, increase the diversity of housing options across the municipality, foster an active and accessible community for all ages and abilities, and to protect the natural, to protect and enhance the natural, cultural, and built heritage of Argyle, and to foster resilient, sustainable, and distinct communities. And really, I, I should mention too that these came directly from our public consultation process uh, to really reflect the community as part priorities and topics they want Argyle to focus on. Uh, in terms of that first goal, um, there's been a number of policies added to the missile plan. So if a conditional application was to come forward, uh, it would really to be to support local commercial hubs and encourage kind of development near uh, where we have existing shops and businesses. There's new regulations for new industries like the ones I've mentioned with cannabis production and patios and restaurants and distilleries. There's also some, a lot of supportive language in the new municipal plan regarding aquaculture. Um, there's also been a change of some home-based industrial uses. Um, so one thing that staff has noticed over time is there's, there's quite permissive requirements around um, having industrial facilities kind of in somebody's home. Uh, the billing code actually doesn't really permit that anymore. Uh, so the documents had to be updated to reflect that. Uh, the other large item for the goal two would be to decrease the diversity of housing options across the municipality to give clarity on lot requirements for uses uh, for multi-unit dwellings and to give permission for more diverse housing forms like group, group dwellings and townhomes. 
So group dwelling is often, as you can see from the picture here, it's, we all have normally smaller um, homes essentially on a single lot, normally aligned around a shared common or shared, shared green area. And townhomes are attached dwellings, like we have more than two uh, attached units. And it was really unclear uh, how that would actually take place in terms of development in the current documents. So we added a lot of um, kind of guidance in the missile plan and zoning bylaw. Uh, to introduce kind of what general requirements that the facility should have for those to ensure they're successful and fit in well with the community. Um, we also did a number of proposals to permit um, four unit dwellings or essentially like a fourplex or a small multi -unit, multiple unit apartment building in residential zones, um, some of which is by as of right, some of which has some development agreement requirements with it. Um, there's also clearer policies for larger development agreements. So if someone wanted to come in and do a 20 unit apartment building, um, what that would look like from an administrative point of view, but evaluating that application. Um, we've also proposed to introduce, introduce dwellings as an accessory use. So um, what that means is let's say if you have a lobster holding facility and you want to bring in temporary workers, let's say, and have a, um, or like a security guard that would, come, that would stay in the evenings, um, you could have a, a dwelling, what it's called, to uh, have have available for them. Uh, there's been new policy direction to encourage new housing nearby to many in services, really to kind of cluster the areas you already have development. And there's been a proposal to introduce accessory dwelling unit permissions in all residential zones. And accessory dwelling units is definitely plenaries. Um, so it, it can be a bit hard to describe what it is because it can take a lot of different forms. Uh, so really, it can mean what's called a secondary suite where you have a small portion of an existing home, for instance, we'd have like a, a, a mini apartment essentially, um, but it wouldn't be kind of cut off from the rest of the unit. There's a proposed proposal to add requirements for what are called garden suites, where it'd be a, a small backyard kind of separate and detached structure, as well, well as a garage suite, which is similar to a garden suite, but it's on top of a garage essentially. Um, so a lot of people will do this to existing garages they have, just do an extension, let's say if one of their family members is ill, or if, or if their kids need a bit more uh, room <laughs> and freedom. Um, it's just, it's just some adding some options that are, that are a bit more affordable for people, either as rental options or as uh, families change and grow. Um, fostering an active and accessible community for all ages and abilities. Uh, we've introduced policies to support and encourage use of active transportation throughout the community, um, really trying to focus development around where sidewalks are. Um, and put in requirements to say for a larger multiple unit dwelling to actually connect into an existing sidewalk uh, with like a, a trail connection or a pathway. Um, there's some recommended future projects, so things for the municipality to consider, uh, let's say funding comes up or something like that, uh, such as community-based ride sharing, um, adopting provincial accessibility standards, and emphasizing the accessibility of um, age-friendly community needs, and the transportation network, and in public places. Uh, there's been some changes and proposed uh, additions regarding um, the protection and enhancement of the natural, cultural, and built heritage. Um, so that's really maintaining those collaborative partnerships you have with adjacent municipalities for open spaces, trails, and recreational areas. Uh, there's a new policy to introduce what's called the subdivision bylaw. So what subdivision bylaws do, right now the municipality uses the provincial standards. It gives the municipality some more direction, and some more flexibility about parkland areas. So negotiating for a, a certain area of land that you'd have as part of a subdivision, uh, let's say having pu public water access uh, as part of a, a new development that's say adjacent to a lake. And then really looking at um, what areas are efficient for surfacing and if there's any other requirements or ways to make things easier uh, for development in areas that are easy to service. There's also been a proposed change with regarding lighting standards or dark sky standards. Uh, what those would be is it would be requiring uh, full cutoff fixtures uh, for outdoor lighting. So that essentially means is that if you had a um, like a horizontal line, let's see if you can hopefully you can see my pointer, uh, it'd be cutting off like essentially the top of the light to, to look up towards the sky. And what that does is it reduces light pollution. A lot of fixtures today are designed for that, or they're what's called dark sky compliant, uh, which means they're designed essentially to, already to do that. And there's also some requirements proposed regarding dark sky standards, and these are kind of the industry standards that the Dark Skies Association has produced. So we would be having warm color lights, 
uh, so under um, 2700 Kelvin. So it'd be like a warm light essentially, or a very warm light. And then there's also a cap for not residential properties, but for commercial properties um, in terms of lighting to have a cap of 250,000 lumens. So you're not kind of overly brightening up, um, let's say a commercial parking lot or something like that. Um, in terms of protecting, enhancing the natural, cultural and built environment, there's some other ones we have. Um, these are really kind of more uh, guidance and less perhaps regulatory, continuing to support the natural built and cultural heritage uh, through facilities, collections, and programs, uh, such as museums, archives, and historical societies, uh, recognizing or promoting the use of bilingual services within the community. And um, we've also, there's this one's a bit more on the regulatory side, we've introdu introduced tourism uses in museums in the marine industrial zone. Um, just if someone did want to, let's say, um, do more of like boat tours or something like that in that marine industrial zone, it would allow that as an option. Goal five is to foster resilient, sustainable, and distinct communities. Uh, as I mentioned previously, there's a new floodplain zone um, proposed for Quinnan, uh, which would restrict certain types of development and require a floodplain study uh, if development was going to occur in that area. Uh, there's been that updated coastal wetland zone to reflect the current provincial forestry and the wetland information. And there's also been some permissions added in for renew renewable energy uses. So really the, the current documents were made before solar panels to say were um, commonplace. So just clarifying that it is permitted and um, that the, it wouldn't have to meet the same height as a building, for instance. Uh, moving away from kind of the goals, we also received a number of individual requests as part of this. Uh, council would have seen essentially all of these, I think, before, other than number four there. Um, this is a proposal at 8522 Highway 3 in Tuscat to be rezoned to light industrial, um, which is included in this draft of documents. Uh, there's one in Morris Island Road to be rezoned from coastal communities to coastal community industrial. Uh, to permit a boat shop. Um, really that location is included in the current draft because it's a large lot and it's a fairly uninhabited area. Uh, there's a property on Dodge Front Road, Road in Lower West Pubnico, uh, which requested to be rezoned for mixed use to marine industrial to enable a lobster holding facility. Uh, we did not propose to include this, that in this um, current set of documents. It, it is fairly close to people's homes. Uh, so we thought it should have some additional consideration and uh, a separate application so people could voice their opinion on it a bit more clearly. Um, there's a development on Frank's Road that I think Council's discussed previously. Uh, there's in between first reading and second reading, so what may happen uh, following this public hearing. Uh, there's been some non-substantive changes to enable that de development to take place regarding the group homes requirements. Um, so the number, the maximum number of units has changed from 16 to 32 units per lot. And then you could also come in for a semi-detached or a duplex option as part of those group dwellings. Just clarifying that that's, that would be permitted. So really the next steps um, for Argyle would be for the documents to be submitted for ministerial approval, if it is approved by council, the second reading here tonight. And then there'll be a formal adoption in the newspaper. And it's good to point out as well that both the current municipal plan and land use bylaw, as well as the proposed one, are in effect uh, until that notice of approval goes in the paper. Um, so it's not, it's not like following tonight, you're, you can come in for a, a, something that might be permitted in the new set of documents. It's, uh, I call it the pain period where you have to meet both sets of plans and zoning documents. Um, so it's, it has to kind of follow that, that period of time. And thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you, Jared. Okay. Does does any member of council have questions for staff? I don't see, don't see anybody raising their hands. If not, what we will do now, we'll open the floor for comments and questions. There were three members of the public who have registered to, to speak. So what we will do, I will go first to Wendy Vickers. Wendy. Right here. You're, you're here. Yes. You're, you're on. Not 
Okay, well, thanks for letting me speak before you this evening. I'm actually here to um, voice my support for the riparian zone regulations that were voted out at last council's meeting in May. And there were four particular statements made during that council meeting on which I would like to comment. Um, the first one was that there are enough crown lands in the area protecting the lakes and waterways around here that we don't need to put that responsibility onto the shoulders of the waterfront property owners. And I have to say I disagree with that statement because the areas that are in need of the greatest protection are those that are facing the greatest impact. And those are gonna be the residential areas where owners want to scrape off the land to put in a lawn, line the, the shorelines with boulders, haul stumps and rocks out of the water, um, haul sand in to make a beach, or even some people even go so far as to dump salt in the water to kill off the weeds and the leeches. So, you know, that's to me is just the sake of aesthetics and playtime. And I think that those areas for the environment's sake need a lot more protection than what they are currently getting. The second um, statement made was that people don't know that this is in the bylaw and it isn't now, but it was at the time. And uh, that's a valid point. And it suggests that maybe the municipality needs to undertake um, better information campaigns when changes are made. It has to go far beyond electronic social media and maybe look at um, TV or radio broadcasts or information flyers in residence mailboxes or even information packages that lawyers or real estate agents can give out to um, clients who are looking at purchasing waterfront property just so they know what they're getting into ahead of time. Um, just because people don't know about a bylaw, I don't think is any reason to take it out of um, existence. I imagine that a lot of people don't realize that you need a building permit to put up a camp or to replace the windows in your house with larger windows or even add a deck to your house. But I highly doubt you're going to haul out the building permits just because people don't know about it, don't care to know, or worse, um, choose to ignore them even if they do know about them. So, you know, what we as waterfront property owners need to know is that our property lines end at the high water mark and we have no right to impact anything beyond that high water mark. We can ask for permission from the Crown to make those alterations, but unless we get approval for that, we don't have the right to do anything to anything past that high water mark. Uh, the third comment was that people want to be able to do to their property what other people have done before them. And, um, you know, times change. The laws change, conditions change, awareness changes. You know, people are very clued into environmental um, importance now. And I don't think um, that, how should I say this? To allow bad practices to continue just to uh, appease some people who want to be able to get away with things that other people got away with in the past is irresponsible in my mind, especially if you know they are bad practices. You know, and uh, I think it's something that really needs to be relooked at because society does need to adapt and change with, with the times. Um, the fourth statement that was made was that those regulations are too strict. If you want to talk about strict, look at Bolivia and Ecuador, for example. They got tired of the environment being sacrificed for the sake of urban development, and they actually recognized uh, nature as an entity and gave her the same constitutional rights to exist as other individuals. Closer to home, jurisdictions across Canada impose uh, buffer zones of 10 to 60 meters, and if my information is correct next door at the municipality of Yarmouth, they have a buffer zone regulation of 20 meters. And what were you guys asking for? 25 feet, that's only 7.6 meters. It's not much, it's a great start, it is, it's a great start, but I don't think it can be described as being too strict. Uh, the reason I am here voicing my concerns is because I live next to Mingo Beck Lake, which is part of the Kayak Brook system. And it's a warm, shallow lake. It's full of weeds and leeches, and even the dogs get swimmer's itch when they come out of the water. But, you know, the th same characteristics that make it so unappealing to those of us who like to spend time in the water are what make it prime habitat for the plants and the creatures that call it home. 
you know, we have nesting loons here, ducks, geese, uh, beavers, muskrats, eagles, hawks, you name it, uh, fish, frogs, and turtles, including the snapping turtle, which is listed as a species at risk, both federally and provincially. The snapping turtle does not come out of the water to bask in the sun like most turtles do. If you see a snapping turtle on land, it is a female looking for a place to lay her eggs. And she'll travel as far as 100 meters inland in search of a suitable nesting site. Uh, this process starts around mid-June to early July, and the eggs don't hatch until sometime around October, and only if the ground temperature is right for hatching. If the temperature above ground is too cold, um, they'll overwinter there. So you're going to have a long period of time in order to provide a buffer zone of some, some kind of protection for those snapping turtles because they are a species at risk and it is illegal to mess with a uh, turtle nest. The Supreme Court of Nova Scotia recently ruled against the province for failing to take adequate measures to protect its species at risk. And it's only going to be a matter of time before that trickles down to the municipalities and extends to other species. The other species we have in, in this system uh, is Gasparo. And the Gasparo provide um, an income, a livelihood, to a group of about 50 to 60 fishermen who fish below Highway 103. It also provides support to the lobster fishery in the form of bait. Uh, Kayak Brook and all its lakes and tributaries above the 103 is a federally protected Gasparo spawning system. It is illegal to fish for Gasparo above Highway 103 in the Kayak Brook system. Those fish come up in the spring and they spawn along the shoreline in the shallows and they really depend on that riparian vegetation for the shade and shelter that allows them to protect the eggs or at least have the eggs protected and for the hatchlings to have shelter from predators and, and UV light and things like that. So um, any impact on that fish, on that species, on those stocks is going to impact those commercial fishermen who rely on it. It's going to cause the lobster fishermen to have to look for a more expensive form of bait and that's all going to have an impact on the local economy. You know, when we move into a natural area, we are the invasive species. The animals and the plants can't advocate for themselves. They can't protect themselves against us. As property owners, our lives don't depend on ripping out vegetation or hauling stumps and rocks out of the water or, or piling boulders along the shoreline. But the lives of those creatures and those plants who live in that ecosystem depend on that environment being left unscathed. And as humans, I think we have the responsibility to look out for the welfare of everything over whom, of, over which we have power, including nature in all of her forms. And I hope that we can prove to be deserving stewards of this planet and that our humanity will win out over our self-serving interests. That's all I have to say on that. And I hope this was the right form in which to speak, but thanks for hearing me out anyway. Thank you very much, Wendy. So, you know, I guess that's, you, you didn't have any more comments or questions at this point then. Okay, our next speaker, we have Charlene Pache. Charlene, are you on? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to speak. I had some technical problems at first, so I'm not sure what I missed. Um, I had some questions and some concerns and comments regarding the cannabis industry that is being set up actually in our neighborhood here. So uh, do you want me to just, as the previous speaker did, just kind of go through some of my comments and questions and just give my general outlook? Sure. Okay, okay. Um, I guess um, as a, a neighbor um, and as a person who did not know anything about this upcoming industry and um, just 
I guess, noticing by an adverse effect the smell, that's how we found out that there was an industry being established here. And I had just a number of questions. Um, one of the questions, because I did a little bit of research once I realized that this enterprise was coming up in our neighborhood, um, I wondered, you know, if we could do something like that on residential use, on residential zones. And then I did a little bit of research and found out that our own property and most of our properties are mixed use. So I assume that mixed use zones allows such an industry or must it be rezoned? I'm just wondering because I thought that we were in a residential zone until I did this research. So uh, it brought another question, I guess, to mine is, our, should our tax bill reflect what our zone is? Because I had no idea we were in a mixed use zone. And is that a different rate or, you know, anyway, that's, that's another sideline. Um, another concern that I had is whether there was a probationary period if an industry such as this is approved by the municipality um, and there's an adverse smell again. I understand that the owner is aware of that and there's some methods, some filters and so on that are being uh, established so that we wouldn't have that kind of smell. But is there a probationary period? Because um, sometimes there are no guarantees in new projects. Everybody has a good intention. Everybody wants to do the best that they can. Um, I remember when I first moved here, I was told that I would not, would not hear the Pubnico windmills. And I'm sorry, but I do hear them and I don't have perfect hearing, but I do hear them a lot. So there, there's, you know, sometimes there are adverse health effects and we're a bunch of baby boomers uh, getting on in age. So if there's any health concerns, um, I do have a background in addictions, so I guess I am not probably the most neutral, uh, unbiased person, and uh, most of you know my background, um, but that is my concern, and I want to make sure that if there's anything that can adversely affect our health and there's some way that we can remedy that, that's certainly my concern. Um, are there any regulations on such an industry if it expands further, if it was to be approved and it's expanded in the future? Because I know that the federal government and the provincial government are, are kind of encouraging these operations. Uh, should it be displaced further from residential areas? Um, and the other thing is if there are any modifications to be made? Should the onus not be on the owner or the operator to check with the neighborhood to ensure that there are no adverse effects um, instead of the other way around? Like we simply found out about this kind of by accident. So, and, and my last, I guess, question is, um, is there any kind of nuisance bylaw or law or does the municipality have anything that this could fall under nuisance? And, and, and I want to be clear that I am not personally attacking my neighbor. Uh, I'm, I'm all for private enterprise and do, you know, as long as it does not adversely affect the neighborhood, really. That is, so I just wondered if that might be um, an option if things don't work the way that we hope. Um, I think that kind of summarizes my comments and my questions. And I thank you very much for allowing me to speak. I guess I was missing a password or something. That's why I clicked half a mm -hmm. trillion times. <laughs> thank you. Okay. so. We can answer some of those questions now. It's best for us to do that right now. So our CAO or Jared or, or Ann, I don't know which one is gonna take that, but whoever 
I see Ale, you're, you're unmuted, so. Yeah, um, so I can start and what I'll do is, um, uh, any planning questions, Charlene, I, I will, I think it's best for, for Jared to answer as, as the planner, but you did also have some questions about uh, other things that relate to the municipality that I'm happy to answer for you. So um, first things first, um, and, and uh, you had mentioned the, you had asked the question on mixed use uh, and residential. So <clears throat> this, this is a bit of a planning question, but I will, yes, uh, confirm that you are in a mixed use zone. Um, a mixed use zone allows for certain things to occur uh, in your community, but it also explicitly prohibits other things um, to occur in your community. So you are correct when you say that there is nothing on the tax bill that indicates what your zone is. And that's an interesting question. I've, I've never actually been asked that question. I actually think it's a really good thing to ask and it's something that the municipality of Argyle really should consider uh, because it's one thing to, we understand that the land use bylaws and the municipal planning strategies can be complicated documents. And so to simplify, where are you now? Uh, that might be useful on the tax bill. Obviously the tax bills went out this year, so we can't do it this year. But I can assure you that we will look at that in the future years. Now, in the meantime, what we have done uh, through our, our map, mapping uh, expert, Alex Dansermo, um, has created a, a, an online map where you can actually put in your address and it will tell you which zone you're in. Now, we haven't rolled that out in a big way just yet. So that would be another way that people could be informed about which zone they're in. Um, and to answer your question on the taxation, uh, the taxation is not in, the tax rate is not influenced by the zone you're in. It is influ uh, what your tax bill, your tax rate may be influenced uh, by the services that are being provided. So uh, generally as residential rate, your residential rate today is $1.09 for every $100 of assessment and you would pay more in your area for fire. You would have a separate fire rate, which I believe is at, uh, I believe it's at nine cents this year. Um, looking at Glenn to see if he's nodding. Like, I, I might be wrong about that, but anyway. Um, so, so the services that are provided will influence the rate. Your assessments uh, will be influenced by the activity around you. So. Uh, you, the sales history of properties in your area would influence your assessment up or down um, uh, as well. So there isn't a separate rate for rural industrial or rural uh, development zones versus a mixed use zone. Um, you do in the mixed use zone, however, have more protection uh, on development than in other zones, but I will, I will, um, I'll defer that particular piece to, to Jared. There was one other question that you asked um, was the nuisance bylaw. So if, if something is occurring, so first of all, that particular development, um, the application for that development occurred before the changes that you're seeing today. So the changes you're seeing today, if somebody else was to look at do, to do this property would look different than what it than what occurred in your in your backyard uh, earlier this year. Okay, so I, I so the rules are actually stronger moving forward. And and again, I'll let Jared address the specifics of that. Um, but the final point on the nuisance bylaw is is that the short answer is yes. We do have we have a, a nuisance uh, particularly noise related bylaw. Uh, there are other nuisances that we can address via other means. So um, I'd have to, in order for me to, to answer your question accurately and fully, I would have to look at the details of that bylaw and see what would we do in the instance where the smell was really a big problem. Now, the other thing that council can do is increase their regulations where people are not being respectful of the smell nuisance that's occurring in the community. So just our bylaws exist the way that they are, but things like nuisance bylaws and, and noise bylaws are often amended. 
and they're often changed to address the concerns of residents. And, uh, and, and we acknowledge that one of the potential nuisances of a cannabis production is, is the smell. And so um, I will stop there and hopefully Jared will pick up the questions that I haven't answered uh, that relate to specifically to what are we planning now and what happens if he, the developer was to change his particular development in that location, what would happen under the new rules and any other uh, things that, that, that we can answer. And please, after we're done, if you have not heard an answer to your question, please let us know because we're, we're doing the best we can, uh, but we may, not, we may not have heard you appropriately. So don't hesitate to come back to us. Okay, and I will mute now, Jared. Oh, good. So it's a complicated question, uh, just with how things kind of get regulated. So essentially right now, the current zoning documents don't list cannabis production as a specific use. So if someone comes in for a permit, they'd have to go in under uh, the closest definition that would match. Um, if you're going to come in to get a development permit on something. In this case, it would be an agricultural use. So th why there's a kind of a permitted uh, cannabis production facility now is because it hasn't, the documents weren't updated as of yet uh, to include that following legalization. So as part of the series of changes um, in that zone, we need what's called a development agreement uh, for can cannabis production facility, which is essentially it would go to council. There would normally be a mail out to adjacent property owners then there could be stipulations on the development. Um, it's a bit of a negotiation between council staff and the developer that's looking to actually build the facility and what could actually take place and what re regulations there would be and kind of what penalties there would be if, say if there's odor or something like that. Um, because there actually is an existing facility now, there's actually some grandfathering clauses that exist under the provincial legislation kind of lets municipality do planning. So they could do a small extension, I believe it's 10 or 20% uh, to the floor area of the building um, without getting a development agreement just because it would be an existing use. And there's some special permissions for things that are existing. Um, the other thing that would take place um, is they could come in for a development agreement to do an extension to that for a larger facility. Um, that would have a, like a public engagement component too with it as well. Um, it's, it's an involved process, right? It's not just like a, you come in, we can't do the permit, you're done. It goes to council, there's a, a public hearing similar to this one here tonight, uh, and people can voice their opinion, and there could be things that get added into the kind of the agreement to approve it, essentially. Um, so that's, I think, kind of the big items. Let me see, I have a couple other ones here that Anne sent me. Um, there's not really a prohibitionary period. Um, something that I do want to explain that's quite complicated with the cannabis um, production uses is there's essentially a set of federal guidelines they have to adhere to, as well as the municipal ones. So what's important to keep in mind is as part of those fed that federal set of guidelines, um, they have very strict controls and limitations on what they're legally allowed to do when it comes to odor. So they're not supposed to be any kind of scent that you'd smell off the property as part of a cannabis production facility under those federal guidelines. And there's actually a complaints process in place that you can use um, if they don't meet the, that federal set of criteria. So in addition to kind of the municipal requirements, and really the federal ones are quite a bit more strict, I would say in a lot of ways than any municipal bylaw. Um, because if, if they have numerous infractions against the federal requirements, for instance, um, the Cannabis Act licenses aren't indefinite like you would get with a development permit. So they, they have time limitations on them. If there's a number of infractions against somebody not meeting the Cannabis Act requirements, they run the risk of not getting their permit renewed. Um, so they could actually have their license taken away essentially uh, to be able to produce cannabis on the site. So that's really, it's, I, th I think it's important to kind of keep all these municipal controls in mind. But I did just want to let you know about all these federal things that do exist because they are very important with how this type of use gets regulated. I think that's all I really want to know. Do you have any other questions or clarifications through you, Mr. Chair? Yeah. Hey, Charlene, do, do you have any more? Do you have, do you want to uh, have more comments? Uh, we'll have to, to unmute if you're, to hold on. Okay, can yeah. you hear me now? You're on now. Okay, thank you. Um, as you were referring to the Federal Cannabis Act and the complaints process, who, what, where, how would I find out 
where that, who, who would I contact and how would I proceed for that? Because that's different from the municipal level. Is that what I understand? That, that, is, that is correct. Go ahead. Yep. I actually just put the link in, this, in the chat bar for you. So there's actually a form on the web that they use for that. It's good that the municipality knows though as well. Um, so if, like, I think it is good to keep the municipality in the loop because it's, if, like, let's, say if the, let's say if the federal government did, did not want to um, essentially renew this permit, they would likely look to the municipality of Argyle and ask them like, what complaints have you heard? Things like that, right? Um, it just gives people a better idea of, of the, the sense of the community about what's going on. Um, so it's, I think it's good to kind of keep both in the, the document, but I definitely start with that federal um, form I've linked in the side there. Can I make it, Mr. Chair? Yes, go ahead. Um, so, so essentially, under the new rules, that if that development did not occur until the new rules were passed, let's let's pretend it didn't happen, and we're into the new rules now. What would have to have happened was a contract would have had to occur between the municipality and that developer. And, and the contract requires us to ask the community for input. And what that contract would also address is, is or attempt to address is, it's an agreement between the developer and the municipality that says, look, we will allow this to happen at this property, provided that you do the following things, right? abide by federal regulations for cannabis uh, nuisance around parking or, or, or uh, smell or any sort of nuisance, like don't, don't, you know, in terms of like uh, unsightliness and other such things are typical in this agreement. And so what happens is the agreement is different than, than the ability to do so naturally, which is what, what that particular developer is allowed to was allowed to do in the old rules. So the new rules are actually seeking to address the very the very things that you are raising, um, and so the mixed use zone has more restriction. But there are other zones outside of the mixed use, more in the rural areas, that would allow that particular development to occur in exactly the same way that it occurred four or five months ago. I hope that clarifies things. I know these contracts and and land use um, um, regulations can be challenging. And I just, that the new reality for, for that location, for, for not for that location, because there's grandfathering clauses that protect the development, but for new or for major expansion of that same location, the new rules uh, would apply. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay. okay, so you're okay, Charlene? Okay, thank you very much. Our next uh, speaker now is uh, John Solos. So John, as soon as we give you your voice there, we can't hear you yet, hold on. Is the municipality of Argyle? <laughs> John, <clears throat> John, do you, see a, do you see a request to unmute? I there just pressed go. unmute. Hey, I think I'm there. You're you're on. Very good. Okay, thanks for giving me the time and thank you, Alain, for straightening out my initial misconceptions about the status of what I'm about to talk about. And Wendy, I'm gonna talk about the same thing as you were talking about. And I I, I like what I heard you say and what I am gonna say I think complements it fairly well. So um, some of you know who I am. Um, I have spent a hell of a number of years involved in research and public education around local water quality issues um, in association with TREPA. Um, and correspondence from a resident led me to check the agenda of your May 12th council meeting. And I noted that you gave first reading to the land use bylaw and MPS at that time. So I did a little bit of digging into the attachments and well, basically, um, Jared, you presented the goals. And under goal five, I noticed, um, and what I was looking at, introduced riparian buffer areas to limit development impacts to water courses. And I said, hey, this is encouraging. And then I went to the draft MPS and uh, section 12.3, coastal wetlands, conservation and environment stewardship backgrounds. 
gives a good convincing rationale for council policies under 12.4. 12.4.3 said to establish a riparian buffer to protect the natural shorelines along all watercourses and wetlands where the erection of structures and removal of vegetation and the altering of land levels will be prohibited or controlled in the land use bylaw. I'm in. I love it. Congratulations, you guys. Uh, this is really good thinking. We've talked about it before, and I was really encouraged. Um, then I checked the draft land use bylaw, section 423, spelled things out well. Um, you said 7.6 meters. Um, I think. Yarmouth municipality is maybe 12 meters. 7.6 is better than nothing. I mean, if you can make it wider, please do. But then I said, then I heard that you decided not to include the bylaw at this time. And I said, what the hell? I'm disappointed in that. Um, so I want to talk about why you need the bylaw. Um, now, you mentioned part of it in the MPS, and I'll read this again. Water course buffers help protect water courses from adjacent development. Retaining riparian buffers around water courses is important to water quality, plant and animal communities, and the protection of property from the natural hazards of flooding. In addition to mitigating flood hazard, riparian buffers also reduce the impacts of sedimentation, erosion, and nutrient loading on water courses. They help to regulate the temperatures of adjacent water courses, provide important plant and animal habitat, and add aesthetic value to the municipality. Both surface and groundwater are important natural resources. Amen. And so, taking the, uh, excluding the bylaw seems to me it violates a good strategy. Um, but I had a few additional reasons. Um, and Wendy gave some good ones, which I didn't think of. But here's some more. Um, the uh, species at risk, the lakes and river shores of the Argyle municipality house possibly the most diverse assemblage of Atlantic coastal plains flora anywhere. These plants do not tolerate fertile environments and include a number of vulnerable, threatened, and endangered species. The MPS, the draft MPS, listed a few of those species, but not all of them. And while some habitats for these species have been identified, there's a good chance that others in the municipality have yet to be discovered. I can remember, oh God, maybe it was 10 or so years ago, we thought the water penny ward only existed on Wilson's Lake. And I think there are a couple of other lakes now on, they call it the Stone property, um, to the east of the Tuscat River between Wilson's and Bennett's Lake. I think there's a couple of small lakes where they've discovered it in there. So things keep getting discovered. So there's one thing. It harkens back to what Lindy was saying about species at risk, but that's a different community. Next one, the temperature regulatory functions of wild lake shores help make our waters more habitable by native fish species, including trout. Yeah, I know there's not many trout left, but uh, maybe that makes protection of them even more urgent. Uh, yeah, I wish more people would eat pickerel. <laughs> um, now, uh, something else, and uh, I've talked about this quite a bit. Blue-green algal blooms, cyanobacterial blooms. Um, They've started to appear in Kegashuk. So far, they have been local, sporadic, and of short duration. Um, I think it was the end of June 2017 at the boat launch. I wandered in there. Maybe it was pollen. I took a sample, sent it off, and there was a real high concentration right in that cove. They don't cover the whole lake. But as, as I'm saying, the, it, it could get worse as lakeside development proceeds. And it's not just a matter of aesthetics. And Kegashuk's not the only lake that might be affected. And this is what's really scary. Cyanotoxicology. This is an, it's an evolving science. The science of toxins produced by these little bastards. Um, and as uh, science develops, uh, they discovered more and more varieties of blue-green algae that have been connected with an increasing number of extremely nasty toxins, which have been associated with things like cancers, neurological damage, like certain dementias and ALS-like syndrome and liver damage. Uh, so it's not just about an ugly green soupy mess. Uh, these blue-green algae are um, potentially serious public health hazards, especially long-term exposure to them. And I want to scare you some more because um, I've been involved with water quality monitoring in the Carlton River system, uh, I guess it's 2012, um, and including Kegashuk, um, and been writing relevant reports since 2013. Um, as our summers get hotter and drier, I'm seeing the color levels in the lake drops. Not so much rain, not so much organic matter being washed into the lakes, so the lakes become clearer. This makes um, light penetration greater, 
and there's less organic matter in the water. And this means that less nutrient is needed to generate these damn blooms. So thanks to hotter, drier summers, we can expect our lakes to become more susceptible to blue green algal blooms. And that means that we need to be more vigilant in terms of keeping them wild, not less. And believe me, mink farms are not the only source of nutrients. Nutrients come from everywhere, including lawns, which some people like to fertilize for God's sake. I don't get that. Anyway, staff at the municipality of the district of Yarmouth do run into frustrations with enforcing the bylaw, but they also tell me that encroachment down to Lakeshore has been reduced since their bylaw was adopted. So it hasn't been perfectly effective yet, but it has had some effect. Improvements are needed, and yes, enforcement frustrations will happen, but without the bylaw, you have no legal basis to discourage the destruction of wild lake shores. You have to start somewhere, and uh, I think Brad Fulton said that when people were saying, how are you gonna enforce it? He said, you gotta start somewhere. I agree with him. So um, what I predict is if you don't include the bylaw, there might be a bandwagon run on wild lakeshore destruction by folks who are infatuated with having a nice clear view across the lake and a bloody lawn going down to the lake. So please don't let it happen. Um, more public education, it's a good point. Um, we had quite a campaign about six years ago, um, including a mass mailing um, to every post office with a significant population in the Tuscan catchment. Um, I'm retiring, I'm not gonna do another one. Um, but I do still have access to a lot of brochures in the TREPA office, and I could bring you a whole box full, a um, couple of thousand brochures in a box, I think. Uh, I think I attached it to the email I sent as well. And uh, it's not copyrighted. If you guys want to print it, print it. But um, a substantial proportion of the citizenry of the municipality of Argyle was informed about this back then. So I really don't sympathize with people that say, oh, don't bring it in because I want to put my lawn down to the lake. Yes, Wendy, to hell with them. Sorry, I'm usually more diplomatic than that, but sometimes you get tired of this stuff. Um, I discussed um, the frustrations of the municipality um, with the mayor of Queens, uh, and maybe it was less than a year ago, because they have similar riparian protection. He told me they don't have many problems. I said, how come? He says, we ticket everyone, no exceptions. <laughs> well, I mean, I pay parking tickets and stuff. If the municipality tickets me for a violation, why should I be angry about it? I violated something. If people get angry about being ticketed for violations, it's their problem. Um, one thing I wanna suggest, make contractors liable for violations of the bylaws. They know. Um, we propagandized to contractors from Clare to Argyle back in 2014. Um, too many contractors play games. They figure they can get away with it and they know better, even if the property owners don't. Um, uh, the current system of laws, including provincial laws, uh, most emphatically do not offer adequate shoreline protection. I think I attached uh, some stuff to my email. Um, the Environment Act concerns itself with damage at and below the high water mark, and it is hell trying to prove that alterations above the high water mark cause any damage. Um, We've been through this before. Some of my colleagues on TREPA board have. Even when science and common sense say otherwise in a court of law, well, how can you prove that there was runoff from that strip shoreline going to the lake? Well, yeah, you gotta be there with a camera when there's a heavy rainstorm and practically it ain't gonna happen. So protection above the high water mark are weak to non-existent provincially. Um, we prepared attached to shoreline regulatory protections for the town and municipality of Yarmouth to summarize our research into riparian buffer protections late in 2018. Um, oh, I see, yeah, you didn't have a bylaw then. <laughs> um, but we did, we talked to people in the municipality of Yarmouth. We drafted a resolution for the Federation of Nova Scotia municipalities. And I think the town and municipality of Yarmouth may have presented that last year. It took a bit of arguing. Um, the reason the town got involved is they were worried about Lake George. Um, so yeah, I think it's good to encourage the province to take this more seriously because the province has longer teeth than municipalities do. So they might be able to convince some of the people that can't be convinced with municipal bylaws. Um, they have issues with enforcement too, but um, I'd say municipally and in the town, um, John Cunningham, Pam Mood, Jim McLeod, they know about this, so talk to them. Um, you know better than I do about the need for public discussion of the bylaw. Um, it would be another opportunity to educate people, but um, 
yeah, I don't see any need to pull it out. <laughs> uh, yeah, and um, thanks for considering my arguments. Please include it, and uh, if you can strengthen it, so much the better. Um, those are my comments from now, and I hope they're helpful. Thank you, John, for your comments. Okay, we also have, uh, we have a letter from Adira Frotten and we have comments from Michael Temple. And I think uh, what's gonna happen is our uh, CEO Alan is gonna read those. Yes. Uh, so this, so the letter, um, and there's also questions about uh, illumination and lighting on the, um, on the website on the uh, Facebook lives, which we will, we will certainly get to. So uh, this is um, a letter uh, to council members. Uh, greetings council members. I am writing to you to voice my concern regarding the proposed lighting bylaw. As a taxpayer in the municipality of Argyle since 1998, I feel that I have the right to light my property as I see fit. I had a light installed on my property last year by NS Power. This light was installed after I had issues with several vehicles entering my property at night. Since I had the light installed, I have no other issue with unknown cars entering my property. Immediately upon installing the light, I was publicly attacked on social media on several occasions. <clears throat> the, the attacks wrote fake news to gain political, fake news in, in quotation marks, to gain public support. And when this pressure did not cause me to remove the light, I was threatened with legal action. I was not given a chance to have no power come and correct the angle of the light before I was publicly attacked. After three visits from Nova Scotia Power, I was finally able to have the direction of the light shine directly on my own property and actually had the intensity of the light downgraded. We should also mention that the criteria for my lights that were outlined in the letter from the uh, a neighbor's lawyer are exactly what is in the proposed lighting bylaw. As a single parent uh, and someone whose job has them up before dawn, having the light on my property adds security and safety to my life. I'm not the only person on the front and road who uses outdoor lights for security as a single parent, not to mention the seniors in the area. Recently in the news, it was reported that the council decided not to act on a request for a speed limit reduction in Eelbrook, as it only came from one resident. Reducing speeds is a safety concern for anyone living in that area. I do not understand how this can be denied when now the wishes of one resident uh, is being entertained. The wishes of the resident who wants the light ban will affect the whole municipality. I know the argument has been made for capping lights and lowering intensity so that the night sky will be less affected, but this will come at a cost to every resident. Why should taxpayers be made to change their security measures to aid one resident and his uh, fanatical ideas on lights and the night sky? The dark sky designation was just renewed with the current lighting and it would stand to reason that the levels of light were not an issue. The land use bylaw has a proposal for a riparian zone to be mandatory for any new developments or builds on waterfront property. Current landowners will not have to reinstate this zone but will be grandfathered in. Perhaps the proposed lighting bylaw should use the same idea and any current taxpayers would be able to keep their lighting and new builds would need to conform to the strict policy. Unfortunately, the deep sky eye chose to build an observatory in the middle of a residential area within one kilometer radius. There are 15 or more residents. Uh, why are these people and the rest of the municipality being made to change their lighting to benefit one business? The city of Halifax has an observatory right downtown and the light isn't an issue there. In fact, I believe that the Deep Sky Observatory obtained their telescope from St. Mary's Observatory. The observatory at St. Mary's is just one example of famous observatories that can see the night sky within or near big city limits. I do not believe that residential outdoor lighting will or is affecting the night sky and the observatory's ability to see the stars. I'd like to ask council members, when you walk out of your home at night, does my light affect your ability to see the night sky? My, my light does not inhibit my view of the night sky. My light is on from dusk till dawn, 365 days a year. Why should my ability to protect my property be diminished so that one business can boast about a darker sky for a handful of nights a year? I mean, if we really go down the rabbit hole, we could perhaps entertain the ravings of fanatics and have the light pollution from the moon removed from the night sky. Also, if the damage to wildlife has been used as an angle for the reductions of lighting, will the municipality also ban hunting, fishing, and spraying of pesticides to save the wildlife. 
So I will pose questions to you, the council. How will you prevent a resident from targeting a neighbor by reporting lights? Will there be measures in place to prevent bullying by means of this proposed bylaw? Why has the council not sent out a mailer to every taxpayer about this proposed land use bylaw and specifically the proposed lighting bylaw? Many, many residents do not meet, read the paper and therefore are unaware of this being proposed. I think that every taxpayer needs to have the chance to speak up on this matter. The fine structure of various bylaws is inconsistent. For example, the fine for unsightly premises is only $20. Uh, what will the fine be for a non-compliant light? It would stand to reason that having properties that look like garbage dumps or are dangerous would be more of a deterrent to tourism and the impression of the area than the fact that one or two starts that are start uh, starts that stars that are a billion light years away might be a bit dim. Regards, Daryl Frog. So that is the the letter as submitted by by Daryl. Um, we, it might be appropriate, Mr. Chair, to, to highlight the, the, the rules that are being in place and, and how they impact both commercial and residential, because I, I know myself that I have misspoke as it relates to uh, how these, these proposed regulations impact residential and, and commercial because they're slightly different. Um, I don't, and, but, but I, I, I would ask the chair for how he wishes to, to proceed um, on that. Well, do we have, do we have, uh, uh, can we do that now? Do we have uh, the information now to proceed with the uh, regulations? You said, you said about the regulations. Jared is better. Yeah, I can, I'll bring it up on my screen, just one moment. I was like, I need to unmute. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, just one second. Um, da -da. So I'll walk you through these. And these are not the easiest things in the world to write, okay. I, will be, I will admit. Um, so currently there's essentially two, two sets, I would almost call it. There's things that essentially apply to every property, which would be in the land use bylaw under 4.6. It'd be subsection I to, I, to three. Or III. Um, IV would apply just to non residential land uses, so commercial or industrial properties. Um, just kind of like give you the, the general lowdown of how the section works before we get into it. So I think if we read it off, it might be the best way to do this. Um, so when, where lighting fixtures are used to illuminate accesses, parking areas, circulation roads, and service areas of any commercial or industrial use, such, such fixtures shall be installed as to not reflect light upon roads and adjacent residential, institutional, and recreational uses. This clause you'll see quite frequently in a number of bylaws, just so you essentially don't have lights that are pointing directly at like an adjacent dwelling or something along those lines. This, this one's quite common in terms of a land use bylaw. Um, and really, it's normally administered on a complaints basis. Um, for the second one there, outside illumination fixtures shall be full cutoff fixtures, not emitting any light above a horizontal plane, drawn through the bottom of the lighting fixture. Note that the properly installed International Dark Sky Association compliant fixtures meet this requirement. Kenneth Row does this one right now. Um, just for a point of information, it's, it's essentially it's more or less regulating the type of fixture that would come into place. And then Outside illumination fixtures shall use a maximum color temperature of 27 Kelvin. That would apply to both residential, industrial, commercial, any land use. And really what that seeks to do is that that's dealing with the temperature of light. So cooler colors of light or more bluish colors of light are more bioactive. So they would have more effects on wildlife essentially is the, is the, the science behind it to my understanding. Um, so it's essentially trying to get people to have a warmer color of light um, if they are putting their lights outside. And then specifically for non-residential land uses, outdoor illumination fixtures have an automated timer or motion sensor to prevent the unnecessary transmission of light during the nighttime when a premises is not in use. And this you'll see often in dark sky areas essentially, uh, just so that light's not on perpetually throughout the night if it's not needed or if there's nobody active on the property. And there's also a, lumen, a luminary cap or a cap on the number of lumens on the property, uh, which is that final clause there. The total installed initial luminary lumens of all outdoor lighting shall not exceed 
250,000. So it's essentially the total amount of light on the property has a, a certain cap on it too for non-residential. I, that's, I think all I want to say on that, let me just mute myself. There we go. So the regulations that we are proposing uh, in the document that is in, in front of you, Council, is those are the regulations that would be included. Um, so I think there's a lot of questions that get asked about the type of lighting. What does that actually mean, right? So what is this Kelvin and what is this lumens? And um, so, so, so we have, so, so this was primarily raised with council. The primary reason why this was raised was to, was to protect, um, was to protect the, the dark sky. So, so the secondary, um, benefits that may come from the different types of lighting, such as, you know, protection of wildlife and, and in such cases where you might actually, um, and John and, and, and Wendy may, may appreciate this, but if, if you have a, the right color uh, illumination near uh, an algae bloom, um, we know what will happen. Like the algae will continuously grow. We will think it's, it's a 24 seven operation. So, um, and so there's, there's certain plankton, plants that actually are activated by a, a certain type of light. But I will say that that, that, that was our second, that, made, that would be like a byproduct. The primary reason was to support the, the dark sky designation that, that the municipality worked on years ago. Uh, certainly that, that one of the uh, astro tourism uh, operators is, is on Fraunton Road in Quinnan. And there is another in at Trump Point uh, where there are uh, astro tourism opportunities there as well. That's a bit more remote and a bit closer to the actual dark sky preserve. Although the the area of Quinnan would be also be considered in that, in that preserve. So that's the logic behind it. And you see that that the the timers on the lights would apply only to commercial. So residential uh, lights would only have to comply with what I would call a, a cap on, on, the, on the light itself so that the light is actually aimed downwards, which is, which is what the purpose of the light is, presumably. It's, it's for security purposes and, and for a lot of the reasons that Daryl uh, actually indicates as a resident, like he, he has put a light up for security uh, purposes and, and we don't, this, this, this is not intended to discourage that. Uh, what it is in, in encouraging is, is the downward lighting uh, to help protect uh, any sort of uh, dark sky preserve that we, we currently have. So I hope that that increases the understanding or, or clarifies certain things. I, I haven't addressed a lot of the things in the letter uh, from Daryl. I'm not sure. Um, uh, I certainly can address certain aspects of it um, as best we can. Um, but, but the rules are different between, between commercial and residential around the lumens versus uh, wattage, uh, not wattage, uh, Kelvin, which is the, the temperature of the, of the light. So a lot of people ask the question, what about LED? How does the LED light uh, fall into play? And, and that's actually a, a more, uh, and certainly I'm not an expert at this and there are people in this room that could speak to that, but, but I think the LED is generally better than some of the uh, traditional incandescent, you know, big Nova Scotia power lights that you see. Um, the LED option has been a choice that Nova Scotia power has, has taken uh, when we deal with our uh, street lighting, uh, in municipal street lights. We don't, we only own like three street lights, but many municipalities that own quite a few. And, and for that, and, and, and we're asked to move to a more energy efficient lighting, which is the LED. And I know that there have been some issues around the intensity of those lights as well, but you can, you can get into an LED situation that would more than comply with, uh, with the bylaw as, as written. Okay, we have, we have uh, uh, one member of the public here who has a question and I'm 
probably it's a question for uh, it's, I'm sorry it's a question regarding what you're talking about right now so maybe it's best if we let him ask that question now while we're still on the subject so it's Timothy Dowsett uh, if you can unmute Tim there you go hi there can you all hear me yes perfect um, so just to clarify a couple of things as well um, with that with that bylaw, when we're talking lumens, especially when it comes to um, commercial properties, uh, 250,000 lumens is way more than anybody really kind of needs, I think. Um, but we, we sort of have to look at the uh, lumen uh, sort of cap as well on residential areas as well, because on residential properties, um, regardless of directing lights down, uh, if somebody puts, you know, 500 lights on their, you know, perimeter of their, say perimeter of their lawn or whatever it happens to be, uh, regardless of the color temperature, if the brightness is too much, it's still gonna be reflecting, especially say in the winter time, where it would reflect back into the sky anyway. Um, but that's kind of not just one thing. The, the biggest thing I want to uh, bring up is the idea of security and that security with lighting uh, when it's done right. So uh, security, it, more light doesn't equal better security. Um, better light equals better security. Uh, you know, directing your lights down, shining the lights where you actually need the light. Um, you know, you're saving energy. You're not throwing that, that, uh, that light you know, that, that's out in the space, basically. Um, LED lights, yes, are great. They save you money. Um, the trick is, is that people, we have to teach people a little bit about, you know, a 60 watt light bulb versus, you know, a, a 60 watt incandescent light bulb versus a 60 watt LED is a very different story. So now that's why we talk in lumens. Uh, you know, that's what we're trying to teach people. You know, one lumen is essentially one candle light. So, you know, if you have, uh, for example, a 60 watt light bulb, um, incandescent light, you probably only need the equivalent to, to get the same amount of light, you'd probably need the equivalent of about a 10 watt or five, uh, 10 or 15 watt LED light type of thing. Uh, and not maybe not even that. So that's just a couple of things to mention, but I think um, sort of a cap on the amount of, of light, you know, for residential properties is also um, you know, required in order to kind of make this kind of a complete package. Um, the other part I wanted to mention was the dark sky designation. We were renewed actually in 2018. Um, and in the report, it states that the, for example, uh, Yarmouth had approached me at some point a few years ago about replacing lighting fixtures uh, to sort of uh, because they were under mandate to do so as all the municipalities were. Unfortunately, it didn't make it uh, for some reason, didn't quite make it to council where it should have been. But in our report for the dark sky um, designations, we, you know, they basically highlighted that these lights did not conform to IDA or to um, starlight, uh, de you know, designated areas. So I suspect eventually we will try to help Yarmouth retrofit their lights. So we're actually in discussion with Nova Scotia Power as well. Um, they're in the process of starting to seek alternative lighting for lights that are existing on, on people's properties. And they'll be, um, you know, we've, we were helping them to identify you know, the, the proper type of lights to maintain our designated, uh, you know, dark sky preserve and dark sky um, tourist destinations for all of Southwest Nova. And this doesn't just include uh, the Argyle municipality, it also includes Clare and Yarmouth. So um, they've spent uh, a lot of great deal of effort and time and money into trying to, you know, keep our skies dark. Also, the one last thing is in Yarmouth, uh, Yarmouth and Acadian Shores did a uh, research. Uh, they had a consulting com company come in a couple of years ago now, I believe, and they did a, a research on the tourism industry and what makes 
Yarmouth and Acadian Shores special besides, you know, shorelines and, uh, you know, all of this kind of thing. And the one thing that stood out on, on top of everything else was how dark our skies were. So Yarmouth, Acadia Shores, you know, the whole province has a big vested interest. And by us creating uh, lighting, you know, regulations that and help to educate people, you know, about proper lighting and, uh, and the whole bit and benefits the entire province um, of Nova Scotia. And we've actually proven that with, you know, uh, bringing, uh, you know, tourism, increasing tourism. Uh, Airbnb did a research and they've shown that we've increased uh, astrotourism by 228% uh, since the 2014 designation was awarded. So it's a win-win situation for everybody. Um, and that's just, I guess, what I'd like, what I had to say. Okay, thank you, Jim. Okay, so we can move on. We can move on to the other uh, uh, letter that you had, CAO uh, uh, Mews. I only had the one letter, but I, I did have a comment right. from a resident that, that had called in um, and uh, expressing similar concerns that the letter that I just read. Uh, but, but more specifically, I think uh, his concern was, was the lack of notice, uh, that, that, that that had upset him, that he, he, did, he did not see any uh, ad or, or information um, that, that came out of the municipality. Um, and so uh, this particular uh, individual would have some, some trouble reading online material uh, because of, of, a, of a site, um, a vision, a vision uh, disability or, or challenge. So uh, would have preferred that uh, letters, individual letters to all residents would have been sent to, to raise this particular issue. So um, I, um, I certainly acknowledge the fact as, a, as a not, a, I mean, as an administrator, I acknowledge the fact that there's always a, there's always a, a way to do more uh, around communication. We certainly went to uh, uh, advertising in, in newspapers and, and did an online, uh, boosted online social media, um, communication and we've been doing that for over over 30 days it's been uh consistent um consistently uh, put out there as well there has been some 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 radio um uh, actually I, I could be mistaken on the radio the radio may not have occurred on this one but it was occurred on another issue so I, my mistake but certainly the the main two areas were were uh, newspaper ads as well as as social media and um and Lori, if I have missed any other uh, way of communication, certainly uh, chime right on in. I know that you were primarily responsible for that. And so, uh, go ahead. No, that was it. It was most, mostly we use the uh, social media. Yeah. So for those that don't have access to social media or to the newspaper or to, um, you know, look, it's, it's a legitimate, uh, we, we met the requirements uh, that, that we're supposed to do in, in terms of advertising and promotion and, and actually exceeded those. But it's like anything else, we, you know, it's, it, there's, there's always a, a more that could be done. And so, uh, in particular, uh, around, um, you know, somebody who has a, a vision uh, challenge, um, I felt that that was kind of a legitimate uh, concern that was raised. And so we'll have to make adjustments moving forward. Sure. Uh, and there, there are some other comments that are on the side, but I think there's others that wish to speak that have, have indicated they wish to speak. Okay. So right now what we have is we're still with the public. And if any other, other members of public uh, want to speak, uh, let us know either by raising your hand or I see a lot of the public I don't see their their their, their faces so I don't know but if anybody else wants to speak it's still open to the public for sure so I don't see anybody but oh, Wendy did you have your I didn't see that I'm sorry go ahead I, I just wanted to clarify um, 
the lighting requirements on I think it was um, subsection 4.6 that was was shown on the screen and there were four paragraphs under that and I think one in four if I want I just want to make sure this I'm clear in my own mind one in four were for non-residential areas and two and three applied to residential as well as non-residential it, it wasn't all that clear I think that was in Jared's um, presentation That was correct. So yes, one, so I and then four, like IV, would apply to um, just commercial land uses, essentially. Um, commercial or industrial, I should say. And then two and three would apply to um, all light fixtures, essentially. So any, any use in question. Okay, great. Thank you. Is there anybody else? So you, Ala, you said you had some. Okay. Yeah, I can go through the questions that came out and yes, and comments that came out on Facebook. If you would, okay. if you will permit me that, and I know that there are counselors who wish to speak because I've yes, seen. I know there are, and we we we're getting we're going to get to that. Then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. All right. Let me just see here. Question, why were taxpayers not sent a notice regarding the proposed bylaw? A notice to the Herald is not adequate to inform people that things are coming. So this, so this is a, a, this is a, a, a second comment on, on what I raised earlier. And, and I think I answered what we did. Um, and we boosted the social media posts. So it literally went to thousands of people. Um, and we have about, um, I don't remember, uh, Scott confirmed this. I know we have close to 2,000, if not more, followers on Facebook some of which are not residents of the municipality, clearly, but, uh, but a, a good section of that uh, is. And we use the social media purposely because we, we advertise certain sections of the land use bylaw as we went, because we knew some of the things we, we may, may cause questions. So, that, so we, we took a piece at a time and advertised those piece at a time. And we did receive comments on those as well, which was good. Uh, so there were pro, uh, Pro comments on the establishment of outdoor patios, um, and so that so as an example, we did receive some feedback. Um, question two: Concerning the boat shops businesses, is there any plans of mentioning the proximity to homes in the air in the area in the bylaw? Um, so there's, I think there were. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna seek a little bit of help on this one. I believe that the boat uh, development on Morris Island was a approximately 800 feet from a resident. Uh, it's located uh, down shore towards the water, uh, cannot be seen uh, from, from the, the regular highway uh, in Morris Island, 308, uh, can, cannot be seen from that location quite remote. Um, and I think, again, I think they're the closest resident there's 80, 80 um, sorry, 800 feet. Um, for that location, so that that location would represent, and I'm not, I'm not offering any judgment uh, on on the appropriateness of this distance, one way or another. But certainly is far far greater than some of the boat building shops that we have on the main drag of Argyle, for instance, and other places in Pumnico where it's quite close to, it's quite a bit closer to more residents than than that one in particular. There was a change in the zoning for. Uh, cannabis, uh, uh, sorry, from, 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 it went from mixed use, I think, or mixed use industrial. That particular property has two uh, homes uh, close to it. And I say close, um, I'd say approximate, I, I would say one of them is in excess of, of, of the thousand feet or more, and the other might be slightly closer to that, but it is already an established uh, industrial building, so it it it, it has already been partially um, uh, designated as industrial. So it was a continuation of that. And I'm looking to Jared to confirm whether or not I said something. I didn't say anything incorrect. Um, so I think for the two, there was a third uh, on the Dennis Point Road, I believe, that uh, most of the properties in that area were actually already industrial use it was the continuation of that property to make sure that that the industrial use was allowable on that property 
So please correct me if I'm wrong, Jared, um, because I, I'm going by memory. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to go off. I can't remember the measurement at the top of my head, essentially on that property with the boat building facility, um, a boat, proposed boat building shop, which is essentially be located at the very rear of the property. Um, and there, there is a residence on the opposing side of it, like closer to the closer to the road. So it's that's part of the reason why we felt it was appropriate to include that set of amendments. I uh, just do the distance involved in the separation, and then compared to what kind of is existing in the, the municipality now, or it was actually formerly in the current documents a um, kind of a home based business in some scenarios. So it's it's just that that level of um, difference essentially. Um, right, and I think internally, I'm I'm almost I'm I'm almost positive it's 800 feet based on our initial look at the property. So yeah. uh, that would have been done by by our development officer. So um, another question I would like to ask: if there will be restrictions placed uh, for chemicals and material used in boat shops such as fiberglass, those with respiratory health issues could be affected if they are close enough. Um, there are no specific restrictions placed on chemicals and material used for boat shops any more than there was in the past. Um, any sort of health and safety issues that, that are related to that particular line of business, that's not really an area that we would control. What we control is the land use, and the land use in that location is far, quite far away from any sort of residence. So we're... So, so if there are internal issues associated with a business, that would be a health and safety issue that would have to be addressed by a different um, level of government, which would be provincial or even federal. I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar, I think it's provincial. Um, the next question was, will the municipality be helping cover the costs of new lighting fixtures? If residents are being asked to change their lighting, this will come at some considerable cost. Is there a plan to help with this along the same lines? What will the fine structure be for breaking this new proposed law? Having unsightly property with junk in old cars gains someone a mere fine of twenty dollars. Will the breaking the lighting bylaw have the same fine structure? So, so it's actually the it's interesting that the fine of twenty dollars was also in the letter from from Daryl. So, so uh, we are in the process of completely revamping our fines uh, structure uh, because of COVID that has been delayed because of the courts are being closed. So, um, certainly our intention is to adjust fines to a more reasonable number. Uh, a fine of $20 for old cars and unsightly property is extraordinarily low and we're not, that, that our intention is to increase and right, right size, I should say, the fines associated with that. Uh, we are not, um, uh, we, are, we are not helping cover the cost of new lighting fixtures uh, at this time. We, we, we will be, the bylaw will be uh, enforced uh, through a complaints process and what what we would uh, choose to do in this instance is to um, take some time to educate uh, the residents and or commercial regarding regarding this issue most most uh, lighting uh, is already um, capped in this way so so there, there are own there there are mostly uh, downward facing particularly if they're Nova Scotia power installations a lot of them are already low, uh, uh, facing down. We don't have a procedure currently to help the cost of the new lighting fixture. Um, that would have to be something that council would, would consider, may consider in the future, but right now that's, that's not something that's on the table. Um, is, okay. Yeah, I should point of a clarification uh, through Mr. Chair as well. Um, so the lighting fixture piece, that would only apply to new fixtures. So the municipality wouldn't be going out and removing existing through a land use by layer, similar to the grandfather we discussed earlier with cannabis production. Um, signs, lights, essentially all those elements that get covered under land use by law do get grandfathered in as part of them. Um, so it would be essentially for new developments moving forward is how this would normally be administered as a condition on the development permit. Thank you for the clarification. That's a very important clarification, yeah. Mr. Chair. Thank you for, because, uh, because we don't want people to think that they're having to spend a bunch of money and change a bunch of things. Now, do we, do we want the education piece to go in and, and have people understand those that are already in the lighting, circum in the lighting circumstances that they are? Do we want... 
uh, uh, for those that are not in compliance with the bylaw to, to, to understand that they, that they are not and that they can choose to be in compliance? Yes, we want to do that. Uh, but but uh, thank you, Jared, for, for pointing that out, that there's a grandfathering provision. Um, so the, uh, there's a question about the islands and district fire department meet the requirements to add a boat shop to the area. I'm not sure what that means. Um, the islands and district fire department would not, would have to meet the same requirements to add a boat shop at its location as any other location in that particular zone. I'm not, I'm not familiar with the islands and district, uh, having, uh, any plan to add a, a boat shop to the area. I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm not sure I answered it appropriately. Um, there is a question on proposed enforcement on lighting by light lighting bylaw. Um, again, I think the grandfathering provision needs to be well understood by, by residents and by commercial. Uh, and so our, our focus will be, yes, we will be receiving potential complaints in the future if people are not in compliance. Our, our approach will be more proactive in the sense that if people are doing new development, the regulations will be made very clear to them so that they understand what regulations uh, are in place so that they can avoid that situation in the first place. Um, uh, Nova Scotia Power doesn't offer a motion sensor light. Um, that is a comment. Um, I think motion sensors are, are typically purchased, you know, at the local store to, for that purpose. Um, I, I, I wasn't aware that they didn't offer a motion sensor light, um, uh, but they, but that is a comment that has been made. And I'd uh, like to ask who puts a 60 watt bulb for outdoor lighting? Nobody, because that is what you use in your bathroom. If you have a large property, you will need more than one or two downward facing lights to protect your belongings and residents. Um, I think the question is who puts a 60 watt bulb for outdoor lighting? Um, I, I think I, I, I can't answer that. Uh, depends on, that's a, that's a, uh, I think it was more of a comment than a question. Uh, there is a question about, as a parent with children in Seisape schools in Argyles and taxpayer property in Argyle, what is in the pro proposed bylaws to protect school grounds from the establishes of establishment of businesses that may have an adverse effect on the health of our children? Um, so there is no provision, I believe, that restricts certain development within a school zone, is I think the, the question that's being asked. Uh, Jared, uh, is there anything that you could add to that? Yeah, so typically if, um, it depends what use you have in mind, but what we've essentially attempted to do as part of this bylaw is that the more noxious or questionable uses would come to council before approval. So really there would be some discretion normally in place. It's not a perfect process, obviously. Um, by any, by any means for that type of thing. But like, let's say if you had like a lounge use, let's say so like a, a late bar or something like that, if that's what you're kind of concerned about, that would normally need to come to council for approval as part of that as well. So it's, it would normally get covered kind of as, in, as part of those development agreement provisions. Um, okay, so, so I guess, and I'm getting some questions uh, leaping in through the comments about the grandfathering clause for lighting. So can we, can we, uh, Jared, and Jared, you're the best uh, <laughs> to share with your permission, of course, um, can we talk about what things would be grandfathered and what things would not be grandfathered in the, as it relates to lighting? Sure. So lighting fixtures, for instance, um, all of those will be grandfathered in through the light, land use bylaw for existing lights. Um, so that's, I think really the, the one that most people will be interested in would be those items. Um, I would honestly need to check the provincial act on a bit of this, but that, that would be kind of the major one. So lighting fixtures, um, kind of the existing lumen counts, essentially what you have in your property now um, would be permitted moving forward. If you started expanding it substantially, so increasing the wattage exponentially, 
things like that, that's when you might run to an infraction or how it's currently written. Um, that's likely the clearest way to explain it to people. If you have a follow up for a line for that, if you want some clarification, happy to. I think, yeah, I think that would be important. And so if somebody had a light that was, was too bright and didn't have a fixture on it at all, yep. um, uh, that, that would be, they would be protected through the transition. So in terms of the, the light pollution itself, so it would be if they increase the light pollution. So any, any sort of change from individuals or commercial that would come from this bylaw, uh, if it was pre-existing, would be done voluntarily. Like would not, we would not be able to enforce, if I have a light inappropriate on my property, um, I can choose to change it clearly if, I, if I'm educated appropriately and I say, oh, I didn't realize, okay, I'll change it. Um, but I'm not obligated to do that if I had a light on my property today. Three, Mr. Chair, I, like I don't work for the municipality, but I would, typically how I'd see this working from an enforcement perspective is if you're gonna come in for what's called a development permit, so if you're gonna build a new structure or a new house, um, or if you're gonna let's say renovate your deck and you had a, a development, associate, development permit associated with that, it'd be what's called a condition on the permit. So it's, it's something you'd actually write on the, that, that permit itself that would be binding as part of that, that permission to build that structure do that set of changes that would include lights. Um, similar to ha any, how any development would happen in, in the municipality, like you have an existing business today, you can't zone someone out of existence, nor could you do that with lighting. So it's everything that you could do and like activities that take place on our property today uh, through a land use bylaw as land use are permitted moving forward, regardless of changes in zoning, just to make that, I, th I think, quite clear. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jared. Do we have a whole lot more of those? That's, that's the end of the questions that I okay. see. Um, there was a, a, a comment, Mr. Chair, that uh, comment that, that a disagreement with the fact that there is a home closer to 800 feet to the building. I see. Um, I don't have that mapping in front of me, but, um, and, and that's in reference to the, uh, the more silent development. Right. Because uh, I'm going to go to, to councillors who had asked to speak. Uh, we had uh, uh, Councillor uh, Dachemont first, who had his uh, hand up. Um, so if he could be unmuted there. there yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Great, all right. So I guess uh, there's a couple of things I wanted to touch on. Uh, I've had some uh, some citizens uh, with some concerns, and I guess I'll go with the cannabis concerns first. Uh, I since the the cannabis uh, grow off is in my district. I did go and talk to not every resident in the area, but a lot of them either face to face, uh, but six feet apart, of course, uh, or uh, via. Uh, Facebook or Messenger, and these are some of the, the concerns. Of course, the smell, uh, and that's what basically sparked everything up with the smell. Uh, people were asking about property value. You know, there's a lot of people there that are ready to maybe retire, uh, maybe sell their homes, uh, and I was just wondering about the property value. Uh, another question that came up: what, Is it a, a legal grow up? Uh, do they have licenses? Uh, I wish that the uh, the owners were, uh, would be online here and they could answer those questions, but I, I believe they do, but I can't, uh, you know, I, I haven't seen the, the, the licenses myself, so I don't know. Um, but of all of them, uh, it was a smell, um, of course, uh, and I don't know much about cannabis, but I learned a little bit uh, from the owners that uh, when the plants bud, uh, there is a smell for probably a couple of weeks there. So. Uh, other than that, like right now, uh, there's no smell. I've been going down there and stopping and monitoring myself. Uh, but uh, the owners have uh, bought two, uh, I guess, uh, high-tech carbon filters, uh, quite expensive carbon filters to put on the vents that hopefully will alleviate the, that problem. So we'll have to see when the next budding comes around uh, if that works. So 
So those were the concerns, and I'm, I, don't, I don't think Charlene is on now, but I'd like to thank Charlene for expressing her uh, her opinions and her, you know, uh, you know, she talked to some of her neighbors too, so it was great, and I talked to her also. Now going to the lighting, uh, the 4.6, so when it comes to commercial, uh, I've been speaking with uh, uh, one of the, the local fish plants here in, on the Dennis Point Road, Inshore Fisheries. Uh, they're a large operation, probably one of the biggest employers in our municipality uh, and I didn't realize a lot of the things that they have to go through uh, you know they need the lighting for the security cameras uh, they need security cameras for two things uh, which I learned today FQF food quality I forget the last name uh, it's kind of like a, a they've got a certification and they've got to keep that up in order to sell to let's say the Walmarts and the Costco's of the world Okay, so those certifications have to be kept up. There's actually inspections. People come and actually see. You have security cameras. You have lighting, you know, because apparently uh, they don't want somebody uh, coming at night and tampering with the product. So, you know, there's things like that. There's the, also the, uh, I guess the uh, CT hat, the Custom Trade uh, Partnership Against Terrorism. That's another one that they have to apply or, or abide by. Again, they need proper lighting, they need cameras, they need security in order to pass those certifications so they can ship their, their product to the US. Uh, I, I learned all this stuff this afternoon. They have safety committees, um, you know, uh, and then of course the lighting, it's, uh, you know, sometimes the, I'd say it's a 364 day operation, uh, depending on which day. And, uh, you know, in the winter time at night, uh, so they do need, so they were worried about the lighting situation. Uh, and the thing was, you know, they said, well, you know, if a neighbor all of a sudden decides that, geez, you know, I, I don't like the lighting, got too much lighting, they complain, you know, could we, the municipality, go there and, you know, give them a warning or shut them down or whatever. So they want assurance that this, uh, you know, 4.6, you know, gives them uh, at least the, you know, the, the, the leeway to, to work with us and to, you know, keep their, uh, keep their lights. And, and, and of course, they're, they're open to learning more about lights. I mean, they, you know, they're, they install lights, uh, you know, 250,000 lumens there. That doesn't mean too much to me. Uh, I don't know how many they have on their, pro on their property. They don't probably know either. But uh, anyway, so those were some of the concerns uh, that they had. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Surratt wanted to uh, have his hand up. Okay. okay. Thank you. I think I'm all set there. Uh, probably a couple, couple of things, uh, three or four things actually. Uh, uh, Jared, Jared uh, uh, or maybe Anna can, can answer this. I want to be sure I've understood that on the illumination that it is grandfathered in. Those that have the lighting now, it, it, they, the municipality cannot force it to, to, to change. Am I, am I right in that statement? Yep, through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct, yep. Thank you very much. That's what I wanted to know. Uh, I guess uh, the other item is on riparian buffers. Uh, I had a good learning curve from, uh, from Wendy, Wendy Vickers. A lot of stuff she brought up, and and John Solos also. I, uh, you know, the species at risk. Uh, another item that Wendy said that it really uh, struck me, uh, you know, because others have been doing it, doesn't mean that it has to be done now. Follow suit of what other people were doing. That really hit a tone with me, and and, and that's so true. How many things that we see, you know, we used to have leaded gas in our cars. And you know, the first thing you have unleaded gas, and that, that, that's a society that's growing and, and not wanting to pollute. Well, this with repairing buffers to me uh, uh, certainly is an item that if it is not included in the, uh, if it's not included in our bylaw, uh, I, I cannot vote for it. I cannot vote for the bylaw, the land use bylaw and the MPS if there is nothing there. Because what I'm so scared of, and maybe I'll add, you can correct me of what we passed a while back. I hope I'm not putting you on the spot, Alan. But I, I, I'm scared, so scared that I've seen it and I've 
had quite a few people speak to me on this. Once it's off the table, it's forgotten. And I understand what they mean. My question, Ala, is to you, if you remember, I should remember this, but I, I, I really, I don't. When we, we made a motion, uh, I think I might have made the motion, didn't we say we, we'd revisit it, but there's no, it, there's, no, there's no motion that says we have to? Do you remember that? Uh, Mr. Chair, through, to, to answer uh, uh, Deputy Warden's question, uh, we, when we did the first reading of the uh, land use and municipal planning strategy, uh, the provisions that uh, John and Wendy raise around the riparian uh, protection were included in that document. Council decided that prior to doing the first reading, it would remove those provisions, and it did so uh, under, not, not because it was uh, ig ignoring the issue of, of riparian, and I, I, forgive me if, I, if, if it sounds like I'm speaking for you as council, but the reasons that were provided uh, included um, greater public engagement, uh, greater, uh, more information, uh, felt that um, there were many people that still had a lot of questions around what that meant for their own personal property. And so because we were moving all sorts of changes through the process, at the time, council decided to take that particular one out, only to have it analyzed on its own merit after we finish uh, the LUB and MPS. Now, uh, the, so, so, the, so there is a question on what happens if council wishes to add it back again. Um, and so, so that question I would defer to Jared because there is a process that you follow and, and so um, I think the process really should be outlined by the planner consulting firm that you have hired. Yep. Yep. So there's three, Mr. Chair. Um, essentially, after following first reading, which we've already done the documents, the changes we can make are what are called non-substantive changes to the documents. So <laughs> no lawyer if Met has agreed on what that always means all the time. Um, typically the things we know are safe and are quite easy to kind of wrap your head around would be like typos, uh, things that are being inconsistent or like when we made a mistake kind of deliberately. Items like this when it comes to repairing buffer requirements, uh, it's a bit more gray in terms of what you can do and what's considered non-substantive. If there's my concern if you added that if you want to add that in following the public hearing would that be would that it was advertised without any of that knowledge on the repairing buffer requirement so you essentially a lot of people won't show up to these type of things if there's things that you agree with essentially um so that that's the one kind of concern i do want to raise for you and i think it is a deliberate like it is a substantial one um you've essentially done a, we've done our kind of engagement on these uh, these matters uh, without those that piece in the, the municipal plan uh, going to public hearing. Um, and I, I really, professionally, I think it should be done if you're gonna add that in, um, just to ensure especially that you get as good a community coverage as you can get in terms of engagement. Thank you for that, uh, Alain Jared. One more thing, Mr. Chair, and this is on the, uh, this is on, on the, uh, uh, just our bylaw being uh, advertised more. Uh, I, I, I would just like to say to the people out there that to reach everybody, it's, it's, it's very hard. I think the municipality has done the best they can. And, and I know there's always somebody that's going to miss something. And I apologize if you did. But uh, certainly, uh, I, I feel that the staff went all out. And they did the best they could. And uh, uh, this medium, you could uh, come here and speak and uh, give you a chance to give your views. And I applaud the uh, staff for doing their best on this. Uh, Mr. Chair, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other councillor? Councillor Digden. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a couple of things that I'm looking at and that I've marked down here. Um, 
as far as, and I, I'm not sure I'm asking here, I guess for a new uh, cannabis operation, is there a minimum distance from a residential property uh, or is in the bylaws that it has to be uh, such a minimum distance from a residential property? And if not, would that be something worth looking at? Like, because I, I know also I've had some, uh, and by no means am I against economic growth and cannabis is here to stay by the look of it. And uh, this, the people that have this operation in Lower West Pubnico, they've personally told me themselves that they want to work with the people around them and that, but I'm just looking at uh, if, if there's a minimum distance or something that we may sh look at, because there's no, um, it is called skunkweed, I guess, for a, for a reason, and it can, it can smell sometimes. That's my first question. Uh, three, Mr. Chair, there's no minimum distance as a stand in the current set of documents. Um, when for a standard processing facility, so one that has over 200 square meters of uh, grow area, essentially, uh, that would be through the development agreement process. So um, why we didn't include a certain cap as part of that development agreement uh, would be that, like, let's say like 150 meters was used as that residential cap. Uh, you might see when that's 148, um, or you may also want to consider proximity to commercial businesses um, as part of that kind of decision-making process. So it's, there's other things you also may want to consider as well, um, which you could actually do as part of that development agreement process as it's currently proposed, um, but it would not cover the microprocessing. So that's the, the current permit that has been issued for that facility is for a micro uh, processing or reduction operation, just so you're aware as well. So I wonder maybe being as though it is a microprocessing operation and we know that there is a smell coming from it at certain times. I wonder, should we be possibly looking at a minimum distance from a residential area um, or from schools or whatever the case may be? Uh, three, Mr. Chair, it's something you could certainly um, look to add in. I think you would actually be able to do that at this point because you're not actually changing the use itself. It's more a condition of approval. Um, Council may want to discuss that. It would be difficult to kind of do that on the fly about what sites that have asked for individual permits already would be affected by that change now uh, without doing some further research on it. Like we have those individual requests of the gentleman that actually did want to start one up. Um, we, I'd have to be able to go back and like check that to make sure it didn't affect them. But that, that's something you would want to keep in mind as well as part of this. Oh, okay, thank you. That might be something that we may, and I'm just saying, we may as a council, you know, may want to look at, that's all. A um, couple of other things I marked down here. Uh, oh, Alana, you were right as, right as far as the West Public Nicole Fire Department, the area rate, 9% or 9 cents, sorry, per $100 of assessment. Uh, Wendy Vickers and uh, John Salo's very educational. Uh, I listened and it's very educational, a lot of stuff I did not know, to be truthful with you. And the other thing I guess I'm looking at here that I've marked down um, is with this new light uh, bylaw and that, and I believe, um, I don't believe, I know I've talked with Tim before about it. Uh, we are looking at a project down here in the Middle West Public or area, uh, some of us uh, from the public, uh, possibly looking at getting some sidewalk lighting uh, down through uh, the area and possibly some street lights on certain uh, areas where the side roads meet the uh, 335 highway and uh, on certain roads because I've been talking with some of the population and uh, they just find that some of these roads it's very dark at night on these corners and wondering about uh, possibly some street lights and that so is there um, lights that would be uh, approved I guess and fall in with the requirements for this new light uh, light bylaws 
be Mr. Chair. Um, the street lighting would normally be exempt from these requirements because it would be in, within the road right of way and under provincial jurisdiction. Um, it depends if you, if you had it on private property directed towards the sidewalk, then it would be affected by these, the set of requirements. Um, yeah, then there are standards in place like the International Dark Sky Compliant Fixtures. There's some other ones that indicate that it's, um, has a modest, I guess, or a lessened impact on light pollution. So it, it would be doable then uh, if we want the, if this project can move forward, then it, it would be doable. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, anybody else? Councillor Shrek. Councillor Sred is still muted. There you go. Sorry, yeah, it's, it's, something came on my screen. I couldn't figure out what it was. Uh, just a question, a quick question, Mr. Chair, and I, I believe Jerry would, that would be able to answer this. Uh, according to the zones or the zones we have, mixed use, general use, uh, let's say next to my house, a uh, residential place, like, can somebody just come and build a boat shop uh, or build a uh, cannabis place or or uh, if somebody wants to come and build, a, put a, a trucking outfit with gravel and excavators in there, uh, uh, just th that has to be zoned if it's resident, uh, compare it residential where I think a lot of the questions I've had also was, can people just come in all of a sudden build something next to you and you have no say in it? Like there are restrictions. And I guess my question is, they have to be zoned, I guess it's, what I get to explain to us. Through you, Mr. Chair, that's a complicated one. So for instance, the next use zone, where I think a lot of the residential properties will be in, a cannabis production facility, uh, micro or standard, um, would need what's called a development agreement. So that's where you'd have additional public engagement, a public hearing, some of the one we have here tonight. Um, and then the conditions that can be placed on that permitted use. Um, which there's, it's quite wide open, frankly, and what you, what you could actually put on in terms of conditions. Um, like asphalt processing plants, things like that, like the ones that are quite noxious, uh, definitely aren't permitted in that zone. Um, nor by development agreement, they'd have to come in for a rezoning and then I guess a strategy amendment and a development agreement. So it essentially be a quite a bit of public engagement that would typically go into that that type of approval. These things are always open to change, like this, um, whether it's a permitted use or what have you. It's really meant to be a living document for council um, to be able to render decisions off of, right, with a lot of these things. So it's not to say it's like held in stone forever that it can or cannot be approved. It's just there's a process in place if council were to want to entertain that a change of use for things like that. Um, there is a table in the land use bylaw under uh, part 11 for, for permitted uses that people might want to take a look at. Um, industrial uses typically aren't allowed in areas where people live. Um, it's one of the big changes actually made with a set of documents. Right now, that actually is qu quite available to do, uh, not necessarily through the building code requirements, but uh, through the zoning uh, bylaw provisions at the moment. Thank you. Okay. okay, I don't see any more. So what I'm going to ask right now is, does any member of staff have any final comments? I should just clarify one thing. <laughs> uh, when you're talking about the cannabis production facilities, I was noting that standard always needs a development agreement. Uh, in the mixed use zones, I believe that's where the current um, permitted property is, that would also need a development agreement. So it would, it would need that contract zone in place. Um, if you're going to do, do a new one with this proposed set of documents to come into play, that would have all the public engagement component into it. And whatever, um, whatever conditions council could negotiate or feels appropriate at the time for that permit as well, or they could refuse that. So again, 
Any any final comments from staff? Any member of staff? Just, yes. Just one one little thing. So I just I want to just clarify. So uh, we talked a little bit about substantive and non-substantive changes to land use. So if you wish to make substantive changes to the document that is proposed in front of you, what you will be asking staff to do, which we will do, is to restart the program. So what will happen is, is you will restart the advertising and you, because, and, and, I'm, and I'm referring to, to the discussion on riparian, right? So I, I, I mean, I, I would suspect that that is, would be considered in most instances a, a substantive change because you haven't told anyone that you were actually going to do this. Um, so the advertising and all the information that was provided to the public uh, would not have included that as a do you agree or disagree. So so I think that would be considered a substantial change. So if, if you want this LUB and MPS to include that now, so you would you would have to you would have to let us know that that's what you want to do. And so obviously it would be, it would be done by motion. And if that's the case, then we would restart the motion, we would restart uh, the process, which means we would go through the public hearing uh, again, we would do this again, and it will, will include riparian uh, regulations in that discussion. Uh, and any other changes that you might consider that would be considered substantive. I don't want to just land on riparian. It could be, it could be other provisions that you feel uncomfortable now that you've kind of had a sober third or fourth thought or whatever layer of thought that you might be on. So, um, so I just want you to know that. So non-substantive changes such as like change this to that and all that can be done like that. No problem. It can be part of the approval process. If council, so, so what will happen is the public hearing will end and you will take all the information that you've received from the public as well as the information you've received from, from, from our experts from WSP. And, and the other option, of course, is to decide to actually approve it as is, which then that will trigger uh, the document to go to the province for their approval because we have to abide by their rules uh, around cer certain land use. Not all land use provisions have to be approved by them, but they have to make sure it's in, a, it's in the provincial interest. Uh, and, and of course, the third one is to defer, that you can, you can choose not to do a second reading at this time, and you can do that at a, at a future meeting, right? So that's, that's just, and I'm saying that really for the public watching as much as I am uh, for council, because guess what? We don't do this every day, right? We don't make these substantive changes every day. So just want to remind you of, of, of the process. If I may. If we were to approve this as is, it doesn't mean that we can't later without, without and, and everything that's in here would be would be in effect. And later we can we can revisit the riparian bylaw and add it into our bylaws. Yeah, yes, Mr. So, Chair. So, uh, we, so, major. We, Go ahead. so we can do that and still if we're happy with everything else, and that's the only one, we could we could approve these. They would automatically come into effect or sooner and then start the process for just the one or whatever else that would be at a later date yes and if you permit me to be a bit frank about it if if you if you if you do if you want to make the change in your existing document now it may take you as long exactly make the changes of all of the other you i mean i think it would be slightly faster if you're going to change it now but what you're doing is you're delaying all the other rules exactly. so these documents are living documents, right? In particular, you know, municipal planning strategy aren't, the land use bylaw is, is, is perhaps intended to be changed a bit more often than your municipal planning strategy. Your municipal planning strategy is like your overarching document. This is what we want to see when, you know, when our guy grows up, we want it to look like this, right? And so the land use is really the application and this is how we're going to get there. So the land use bylaw often gets changed. Um, and the municipal planning strategy does get changed and it can get changed at the, at the will of council. And guess what? We have an election in October, a new council comes in, they may want a different approach on something. So, but what we should remember as decision makers, as council, and, and, and Jared and, and Anne would confirm, I, I hope, uh, is that whatever you do, understand that the rule starts at the time that you do it, right? So, so there, the grandfathering provisions that we've talked about would apply for pre-existing situations that you wish to do away with, for instance. Uh, there are protections in place for those, um, for those developers and, and, and homeowners that 
that have that have made a decision to develop their property abiding by the rules of the day, right? So, so if the rules change, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody instantly abides by those rules. Um, I think most law-abiding citizens would seek to to do some changes on their property, uh, perhaps voluntarily, but that doesn't mean that we can enforce it. Jared, okay. is, that, is that okay? Yeah. Oh, I think I think that was excellent for you, Mr. Chair. I think the one thing I would add, just I think this touches on both the lighting pieces and the repairing and buffer pieces. Is normally council will enact something um, with any of these kind of more overarching topics, and there'll be a large kind of public engagement component to like ideally afterwards or like signs that would go up let's see like a home hardware or something just to kind of inform people about the changes and like what those requirements are um it's always it's always a process with every department i've ever seen that has a uh, planning staff uh to try to educate people about what these requirements mean and really try to make it as plain english as they can because it's certainly a, a difference between legislative language and um plain english <laughs> Okay, so I guess the next one is, is uh, you're recommending it, that WSB is recommending the, that council give second reading and approve amendments to the land use bylaw and municipal planning strategy. Is that correct? That's correct. That is correct. Yeah. Yes. So that's the recommendation from from uh, WSB. I guess what I'm going to ask, are there any final questions or comments from municipal councillors? They have their chance. Councillor Strett. Uh, I'd just like to make a, make a statement here that uh, I'm going to take what I said a little earlier uh, about not supporting this. Uh, you know what, with Jared and, and uh, our CAO speaking, it certainly has... Uh, I really feel now you've certainly implanted in me in my mind that we're going to address the riparian, you know, buffer, and uh, I will support this. No problem. I, I appreciate the both of you uh, putting that statement out. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I okay. Uh, see you on news. Uh, no, I was just indicating that Glenn and I believe Nicole had their hands up. Oh. Nicole, did you have did you have something? Okay, go ahead. I think I'm good. I'm not sure. I just kind of want to um, kind of piggyback on what Guy said. I think we just have to be sure that we have to make a commitment that we're going to come back to it to the riparian buffer issue and make sure that it's not something that just kind of falls off the table and we forget about. And you know, I, I but I think we're pretty good that you know we we understand each other and I think you know it's important we we do make a commitment that we will come back to it. Okay. Who else had their hand up? Okay, Councillor Digden. Uh, thank you. The yes, the riparian buffer, no problem. Coming back to that one, the light issue. I think the uh, questions that I had were answered. I just honestly don't know if we shouldn't be looking at a minimum standard distance again for. Uh, micro cannabis grow ops because um, the way it seems like there now is it can be pretty well anywhere. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right or uh, or reading that right or understanding it, but I think maybe we should look at that one a little more, possibly think about that one a little more. Uh, a lot of the other stuff I've heard and seen here sounds good a lot of works went into this uh, and i know uh, there's been a lot of community involvement go into it but again i'm just having a little bit of a hard time with possibly putting up a micro cannabis operation uh, in a residential area or uh, without no minimum distance between that and the residential area I guess to either uh, CAO or Jared, uh, what would that entail? Is that substantial uh, change as well? 
So, so sorry, just to clarify, if we were going to put in a minimum setback requirement for cannabis production facilities? Yes. Distance, yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, we'd want to decide on a number um, for one. So it's normally it would vary in micro, micro production is a bit new. So it's typically the numbers they have for setbacks are for standard production facilities. They'd vary between about 75 meters and 150 meters uh, for the standard production facilities. So if you were gonna add that in to the documents that actually go in the municipal plan as a um, item to consider as part of a development agreement application. Um, if you wanted to do, hit that for um, microprocessing facilities, that would need to be in the, um, would be both in the municipal plan and the, in the land use bylaw, because some of them are permitted by development agreements, some are permitted what's called as of right in the existing industrial zones. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Chair, just yeah. I, I, uh, two things. Number one, I, I just want to clarify to those that are watching and listening, there, there was a motion passed that yet, while the riparian shoreline protection be removed, but the intention to revisit the buffer at a later date is by motion. So you have commitments already. Mm -hmm. Motion. So the the second point on the changes to the separation distances, um, some of those would like if they're done by development agreement, then the development agreement would typically take on separation distance as a potential item. Am I correct to say that? So where it's an issue for Councillor Digden would be on the as of right developments for micro because none of the standards are as of right. They're all, so, so basically the smaller operations that do not require development agreement, which would be uh, in like rural development zones and other zones of that nature. Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, the industrial zones, essentially. So properties that are zoned industrial um, use at the moment. And there's different industrial use zones uh, in the current set of documents and the proposed ones, but yeah. So, so, so Mr. Chair, just for clarity, I just want to make sure that we're all understanding and that, that Councillor uh, Councillor Digden's concerns are addressed and they may in fact already be addressed. And that's what our, where I'm heading, is that if we can only do an as of right for micro in industrial zones, then the separation distance is, is um, I, I, what I'm hearing is the concern is the distance from residential areas, not necessarily industrial areas. I, I certainly hope I'm not speaking for Glenn in, in, inaccurately, but I think the issue is close to residential homes. So what I'm hearing is that you're either, if you're as of right, you're in an industrial zone and if you're not in an industrial zone, you're by development agreement. And inside that development agreement, separation distances would be addressed. Is that correct? Yep. Yes. Yeah, three, Mr. Chair, that's correct. And the rural development zone would also be permitted as well, which is like quite, it's not a residential zone, it's not an industrial zone, but it's quite rural. Okay. So, Mr. Chair, the rural development zones would be locations such as um, I'm trying to think of communities that would be rural developments. Quinnan um, would be rural development. No, no. Quinnan that's village. that's three, Mr. That's village. So it'd be outside of Quinnan, actually. <laughs> yeah, like Springhaven would be uh, an example of rural developments. Uh, areas of East Kemp, not all of East Kemp, because I know East Kemp is a village as well. Um, would uh, I believe like areas like Surrettes Island and Morris Island would be would be rural development unless they were zoned otherwise. I'm just trying to give context, I, I mean, of, of what rural development looks like in your community. Um, so none of the mixed use zones. Uh, so Tuscott, Pubnico, and Wedgeport would all be development agreement because they're all mixed use. And I say those villages proper, there are sections of those that may not be mixed use, but for the most part they are. Um, so I'm just trying to understand the magnitude of the question and maybe that's why I'm talking until I, until, until we get an answer. Yeah, three measure. I can actually show the map of it. That might actually be the most helpful thing where the rural development zone is. Yeah. So, um, so I guess the concern that Councillor Digden is raising would only be in these sections. Yeah. So it's the rural development zone is large. So it's this green 
um, permitted zone essentially, but it is mostly outside of the developed areas, right? So it's it's a lot of woodland essentially, um, in large part. So and the orange is um, the village zone. So, so I I was wrong in 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 my interpretation of where RD actually is. Um, if I'm looking at certain communities that I referred to, I don't see them as being rural development. Yeah. So mostly out in the woods. And, and that there would be mostly where there'd be no trouble uh, or problem with uh, with. Uh, smells or odors coming from it. Uh, is there any way that we could have um, anyone that would be applying for a micro uh, cannabis grown operation, it need a development permit and come back to council? We'd see exactly where they're wanting to put their, their operation at, see what's around there, and then uh, it would be a council's will. So, Mr. Chair, that would be that would be what the development agreement would allow. So, the development agreement is exactly that that it would have to come to council. So, I think the recommendation that's coming from staff and from and from uh, WSP is that that makes perfect sense in a more populated area. But it makes uh, but but the, the the decision or the recommendation would be that 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 some of this development would be allowable as of right in certain uh, less uh, populated areas. So I think the where, the where you require a development permit is, is our attempt at addressing the very question that you've raised. Uh, but, yeah. Go ahead, sorry. No, go ahead. I, was, I thought everybody was done. <laughs> no, no, Glenn. But those development agreements are not always required for a micro uh operation are they that that's correct they they would be required for micro in the zones that we discuss mixed use etc uh they would not be required for micro in rural development zones they those particular developments would be able to be done as of right which means as long as they meet the minimum requirements that are in our bylaw, they could do it without having a public hearing or without having special permission from council. So it, it ultimately, it's a balance between how much do you want to regulate and how much do you not want to regulate. And, and so if you're required to, to look at this every time, that is absolutely the choice of council if it wishes to do that. Right. And so, but, but to do that, I suspect, uh, you either you either do separation distances, which would be a predetermination to, to uh, distance, which which would allow still would allow an as of right development if they met the requirement. So basically, it's like you're allowed to do it here, provided that you are this far away. Okay, so that that's not how it's written right now, as and it's confirmed by Jared. Um, but what it is is that in those areas where it's highly populated. You can't actually do it at all until council is satisfied that that you've met uh, those requirements. So that's how it's written now. And if and of course, if 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 council wants to make that change, um, I would defer to to Jared as to whether or not that would be considered substantive or not. So is that with a micro operation? Yes. The standard operations are all development agreement, correct? Yeah. yeah. And those are the biggies. Those are the big ones, right? Three, Mr. Chair, maybe we should, I have the table in front of me for permitted uses. Maybe I'll just bring that up and that I think will clarify a lot of the confusion here. Let's see. Da, da, da. Okay. So this isn't from the land use bylaw. Um, so standard production facility in the areas it is permitted, it's the DA indicates it'd be appropriate through development agreement uh, with council's consideration and approval. Um, for the micro facilities, the DOS indicate where it could come in through the development permit. So just going to the development officer for a, a permit, um, which would be in the light industrial, the heavy industrial, uh, the coastal community industrial zone, 
in the rural development zone. And then you could also come in um, through a development agreement, uh, which through council's consideration with public feedback and what have you, um, in the coastal community zone and the mixed use zone, which would be the more, more residential zones. Something more to add to that, Anne? Okay. I, I personally would just like to study that one a little more uh, so we don't get into another uh, issue like we're in now down uh, where there's no operation now in Lower West Pubnico. Uh, well, that, that is something I guess uh, to discuss whether we have a motion to approve these or if we're not it and we correct at our next meeting. Once we come out of this, then we go into a regular or a council meeting, and that's where we're going to discuss whether it's going to require a motion to either approve this or, or whatever we decide. And I think that's where these discussions are going to have to take place. So, are we okay? So, I guess this we're coming to the end of our meeting of this meeting, and then we're supposed to have to to begin the council meeting where a motion will be made on these documents. People can watch the meeting on a municipality of Argyle Facebook site. Um, we're going to be changing. We're going to be coming out of this uh, uh, Zoom uh, uh, connection, and we're going to go into into another one. For our, uh, for our council meeting. I know it's getting late. Uh, we may have to do something with the agenda that we have, but I think we're probably going to have to, we, we still have to go, and I think it's a good thing to discuss this, this item here, which is on the agenda for our coming meeting. So that concludes tonight's public hearing. I want to thank everybody for joining us for the comments from the public and from counselors. And again, thank you for joining us. And you can watch the other one on online.